Today's episode, if you are missing out, is sponsored by Fiverr. You may know Fiverr as the preferred source for freelance services, but did you know that they also provide online courses as well? Learn from Fiverr is an online, on-demand video classes platform, specially tailored for freelancers and professionals. All classes are taught by top experts who are distinguished in their fields. These courses contain practical and comprehensive knowledge. By taking a course, you'll level up your skills and grow professionally. And by successfully passing the course's final quiz, you'll showcase your new capabilities. And the best part? Pay only for courses you want to take, with no monthly fees. Visit our show notes for more information to see if there's a Learn From Fiverr course for you. Every course you enroll in using our link goes directly to making this show better. Thank you for your support. And now, on with the show! Gentlemen, what's a fictional movie you remember changing your perspective on a real-world issue? Mine's a pretty obvious answer because it's a movie most everybody has seen and I think affects them all in some way or another. Uh, It was the most definitive example, which is 12 Angry Men. Uh, You know, I think everybody watches 12 Angry Men in like high school or something and comes away with some kind of feeling about it. Now, whether you come away from it uh, feeling a distrust or a greater confidence in our justice system is, is, you know, its own thing. But for me, I think the thing that really struck me about 12 Angry Men when I saw it as a young person, is that I think what it did when it came to my views on just our entire concept of justice and a justice system is 12 Angry Men reminds you that every single person who has an assessment or an opinion of an issue is bringing their own shit to it, right? That's the key takeaway for me that, that kind of affected how I, I view things from here on out is that, you know, as much as we want to believe like, oh, a jury of your peers, that can lead to an unbiased view. Like there is no unbiased view. No matter how much we want to do it that way, everybody brings their own thing to it. You know, you have the story about the little old man who just wants to be noticed. You have the guy who's really just mad about his son. Anytime you hear anything or I hear, anytime I hear anything now about uh, a verdict or or a decision or or any kind of judgment when it comes to uh, how we treat people in the criminal justice system or in the court of public opinion. I always just now think of the idea that the system is inherently flawed because we all bring our own inherent biases to it. And I think that's something 12 Angry Men really gets across. My answer is any given Sunday. It's honestly probably the most honest sports movie that's ever existed. It is an unvarnished, hyperactive, dirty look at what pro football is. What it was in the 90s, and thus what it was in the past by getting such icons like Johnny Unitas and Jim Brown and such in the movie. But basically that it hasn't changed, that it is just a business where money comes first and the people that make up the game are just commodities we don't actually care if they live or die or get hurt or if their brains explode out their asses uh it is just a filthy horrible industry no other sports movie honestly before or since has really gotten to the horrible cattle-like way this industry is run and you kind of have to be a special kind of an animal to succeed in that industry because it's tough. You're going to get your ass kicked and you're dealing with a lot of fucking psychos that have, that have gotten their asses kicked their entire career. And it's a dirty, messy fucking movie. And it's just one that you watch and you go, wow, this is not Rudy. This is, this isn't even the longest yard. You know, this is, should we be allowing this kind of thing to exist? And, um, yeah, I don't know. A- Any Given Sunday is one that kind of jumped out at me at first, because I think it's honestly the only one of its kind. There's nothing else like it. Every year since 1989, the Library of Congress has selected 25 films to add to the National Film Registry. The criteria? The films must be culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Each week on You're Missing Out, we take a look at one of these films to try and get to the heart of why they were selected and why they still matter. This week, returning guest Kenny Nybart joins us for the 1932 crime drama, I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. 
our guest today, returning guest to the show, friend of the pod. I guess we now have to say former podcaster because he's, you know, he's not about that life anymore. Kenny Nybart joins us once again on the show to talk about I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, guys. Thank you for having me. <laughs> the rehabilitated podcaster himself. <laughs> so nice to be back on the pod. This is really exciting for us because, you know, you recently wrapped uh, a long tenure over on Podcast Like It's 1999, which is our kind of, we've, we've called it sometimes our sister show. You know, uh, obviously you've stepped away from podcasting. I have to say the fact that you're making your uh, podcasting return on our program, that kind of makes us like the David Letterman to your Johnny Carson, right? Like you step down from sure, the Tonight Show. Sure, I see that. You step down yeah. from the Tonight Show, and and instead you're like, occasionally I'll show up on on the Late Show with Letterman. Like I'm not yes, going on yeah. Leno, but I'll show up on the Late Show. That's this no, is your no, Late I, Show. Yeah, I mean, I did two episodes of Screen Drafts right away, but you guys are too. Also, uh, you know what? <laughs> you know what? All right, but you are. All right, you, fine. You, Clay you... Keller. Clay Keller is the David Letterman in this scenario. Where Craig Kilborn. <laughs> yeah, you're the Kilborn. Uh, no, no, it, it, it is very much like that. And this is kind of, you know, the, the only way I want to appear on podcasts anymore. I want to, I, I want to, you know, kind of come up for air on friendly podcasts with, uh, with hosts I like hanging out with and then, you know, retreat back to my, my, my hole, my, my hole without uh, audio equipment. And, um, and and you know not watch so many uh, any movies that I don't want to watch and watch a lot more movies that I do want to watch. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I love that know. philosophy, Kenny. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I I said it Sounds off. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I said it off, Mike. But we we said this is a really setting a bad precedent for Tom. Kenny's gonna let Tom find out that he can stop doing this at some point, and then yeah. we're in trouble. I think I again, I you know you you eat, you eat too much of anything, and you're gonna throw up. And I, so many 1999 movies, and, and in particular, a lot of really bad ones. You guys were on for half of them. <laughs> um, you, you guys at least are all, are doing all kind of, you know, the, the point of the show is these are, these are kind of accepted canon credits. I'm sorry, classics to some extent. And they're from different time periods and they're from different genres and they're from different directors. Um, so I think, you probably, yeah, it's maybe you'll throw up less, but mostly these are, most of you are doing great movies, right? Yeah. What would you say, what would you say the hit rate is for a movie you're really happy that you watch slash saw versus something that you're like, Ugh, what a, what a piece of shit, or this is homework or I'm exhausted. I mean, I, I, you know, Tom and I might have different, my thing is I've never come away mad, even if I don't like a film and I haven't had that many, I've never come away mad because part of the thing with us that's, that's fun and this is something that you talked about with your show too. Like the, the reason you did your show the way you did was you're like, I want to do every movie in 99 so I can say that I did it, right? You wanted to uh, to finish the story, if you will. Yeah, run the marathon. Yeah, Cody Rhodes, finish yeah. the story. That's Thank right. you. You knew where I was going with that. <laughs> uh -huh. That's my, I'm getting the neck tattoo. It's going to happen. Anyway, um, but you wanted to do that. For me, like part of the fun of this is we talked about it early on. Like when we watch these films, the idea is like somebody picked them. They were picked for a reason. Let's try and figure out what the reason is. So even if I come away from a movie and I'm like, well, that's that's not going into my rotation, uh, I do at least get to sit down and go like, well, this gives me an opportunity to look into a different time period to understand not just the America where it was made, but also the America where it was selected, which yeah. is, you know, so there's a lot of layers to it from this angle that I, I I've never come away, even if I don't necessarily love a film. When I go to watch it for this show, I have more of an appreciation for it because I have to, you know. Yeah, I we we didn't we didn't have that aspect. Uh, and Tom, I don't I want to hear your answer, but we didn't have that exact aspect. I'm glad someone you know, wants we, to hear Tom's answer for this. We one. weren't we weren't curated. You weren't we weren't curated by anybody, but you know the Almighty. <laughs> but um, but I do love that thing you're doing. You know, Best Pick was one of my favorite podcasts too, and and obviously all the Best Picture winners aren't great. But they are all interesting uh, because they did win Best Picture. You know, in yeah. in and of that, a body of a body of film professionals said this is the most important movie this year, or the best, or whatever they wanted to determine that. Uh, and I, I find that fa that aspect about this podcast uh, quite fascinating and uh, worthwhile. Um, I'm not down to just kind of pick my favorite movies and talk about it. That's very boring. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the hit rate is actually pretty good here. Like, I, like Mike said, I don't think they're not all the movies we watch are going to be added to my rotation or anything, but I am glad I watched them. I think, honestly, the last time I watched something for this that I didn't like, but I could still talk about in the, in a way to appreciate it is like, I don't know, Gone with the Wind. I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I don't like this, but I could talk about it. But, you know, we also have the benefit of we break it into seasons, so we're not like recording all the time. You know, there'll be a few months stretch where we're doing a lot and then we take a break. Uh, and you know, I do have such like, I don't know, cinematic ADD where I, I don't want to watch the same thing over and over again. So where it's like, in a sense, yeah, this shit is homework, but I do want to watch these things. But to also like offset that, I've watched like three Sonny Chiba movies this week, you know? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm you know, you, you I'm having You tend to go my... on runs, I've noticed on your letterbox. Yeah, you tend to... I do, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I try to like balance things out, you know, like if you watch, if you follow like Griffin or David from Blank Checks Letterboxd, you'd be like, oh, I know what series they're gearing up for. But with me, Mike has made the joke. You literally have no idea what is going on in Tom's mind at any Not time right. other than, oh, well, he's, he, he watched a few Kung Fu movies this week. And then he also watched, I don't know, a Mike Lee movie. What is that about? <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's a good way to, get the historical context and all that stuff the way Mike was talking about, but also to allow me to chase that cinematic ADD of just, I want to watch everything, but I don't want to watch the same thing over and over again. So, you know, it's like, I, I got to watch David Holzman's diary. How am I going to balance that out with, okay, let me watch Superfly and the Superfly remake and Belly. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, it's, but, Belly, good movie. Superfly remake, surprisingly, very good movie. Is it really? Director X. Director X. He, it's it's very belly influenced. Yeah. It answer it answers the question, what if anything interesting happened in Superfly? So, you know, we make the joke, it's true. Sometimes I get like, oh my god, I gotta fucking go on a podcast and talk about things now. Uh I just wanted to lay <laughs> down and do nothing. But it, it, I I do genuinely appreciate it. It once the season ends and we're gone for a few months, I'm like, all right, I, 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 I I've recharged. I can get you back into something. the swing of this shit. You yeah, we did something. Accomplish something every every uh, year or season, rather. Yeah, that's a good feeling. It is a good feeling. So you know, it's I get a little worn out, but I balance it out with other things, and then the season ends, and I can recharge and kind of miss having the structure of of this thing but this week we had a very good movie hey uh, you did a transition the transition over here i could see (laughs) i could see i could see mike just like where how how am i gonna transition i i I could sense on your face yes this movie rocked i if you don't mind yeah please oh i don't mind because my Preach. sense is all right. So no, no, I, I no. This movie did rock. It was amazing. I texted you. I emailed you guys right after. It was my third time on this podcast, and I think we're trying. I was trying to kind of find my lane in the Library of Congress, and I think you guys found it for me. But I still don't really understand how you knew. <laughs> and Mike, <laughs> and Mike, you basically said like, I listened to all your podcasts. I knew, but I don't know. I didn't know this was this was my movie. I, I can tell you, because this was one, you know, so in the past, the past two seasons, we would send you and Phil Isco over the list of movies virtually untouched, right? We were just like, no one's picked, you guys pick what you want. Uh, this season, uh, I, was, I sent a truncated list to Phil because uh, Patrick Kotner had planted his flag in Frankenstein uh, over a year ago, and Phil was very disappointed, but he came on for Chinatown, we had a great time. Um, with you, Kenny, because I always watch the films before we start sending out the invites so I know what we're dealing with, right? I always want to know because, you know, if I'm talking to people, I don't want to say, I don't know what this movie is, or worse yet, go, I didn't know that objectionable thing was in there. And there was just something about, I'm a fugitive from a chain gang, but I messaged Tom and went, I don't want to give Kenny options. I just want to tell him, you got to do this <laughs> because it is the ultimate kenny movie and i don't necessarily mean that in the sense that it is the movie that you would write or even the movie that you would say this is my favorite movie but having listened to your show as long as i have and having had you on our show i am a fugitive from a chain gang has 
all of the elements of the things that you, when you talk about what somebody can do with a movie, Mm -hmm. it's in there. That everything about the character Paul Muni plays is something you gravitate to when you are talking about what you can do with a character in a movie. The structure of the plot, not that it's just a typical three-act structure, but the exact way that the, the cause and effect of every little element of the plot and the way that it's not didactic, but it also makes sure you understand where it's coming from. Like, there's so many elements of this from the script to the execution. And look, I know you say on your show a lot, like, you enjoy maximalism in movies. And I would not say that this is a maximalist movie in its execution, but it is a maximalist movie in its soul, in a way. That it's basically, oh, sure. you know, it is a movie that just has such a sense of urgency. Of, of having to make this point and get this point across, so. Not to be lame and stupid. Uh, it, for 1932, it's insane what they pulled off um, uh, from, from an action standpoint. Mm, yeah. Um, there's an action sequence at the end of this movie that is, by today's standard, thrilling. You know? Oh, I, yeah. Did you guys see, I'm sure you have, because you watch movies, did you see Babylon? Yeah. I haven't. You have it. Um, I, 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 I certainly saw Babylon and texted Tom throughout I, Babylon. So I didn't quite, I didn't quite care for Babylon. Same. All right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I feel like, I feel like that's not the cool point of view these days. I think the cool point of view is Babylon was great, but Babylon was not great. The only great scene, Mike, and I don't know if you agree with this, is the, the silent movie scene. Where they're shooting fifteen silent movies at once mm-hmm. uh, on that field, which is like thrilling. It's 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 saving private it's saving private Ryan opening scene esque, you know, massive scale um, you know, blocking and uh choreography. It's it's really amazing. And uh it that's something I re- I thought of when when you we were you're watching I'm a Fugitive for Chain Game, you have this incredible escape sequence at the end. Um that you almost can't believe they pulled off in 1932 um, because there's, it's all practical. It seems like they used very few miniatures, if any. I think that I spotted one scene that was maybe miniatures. But for the most part, that they're, they're, it's a real truck on real bridges with real explosives, with real people in the truck, with real backgrounds. I mean, some green screen at, at some points. I mean, not green screen. You know, it's yeah. like the um, whatever it is, the thing going rear past. But, uh, yeah. Rear projection. But at some points. but um. But for the most part, it was this, this incredibly dangerous Buster Keaton esque, you're going to die type uh, type escape. So that was kind of a thrilling thing too to see in a movie from this period. So before we get any uh, anything more into that, I do want to make sure that we read what the registry had to say uh, because I do think it's it's very interesting as you're bringing that up and and you know kind of how this film was received then was received in the '90s and now. Here's what the Library of Congress had to say. A compelling Academy Award-nominated performance by Paul Muni as an average guy framed for robbery and sentenced to hard labor distinguishes this Warner Brothers social conscious picture from most others of this era. Based on a series of works by Robert Elliot Burns, himself a chain gang escapee, uh, the film vividly depicts the prisoner's despair as his strength and dignity are stripped away until escape becomes his only option. Director Mervyn Leroy, Little Caesar and They Won't Forget, pulls no punches in showing the brutality and corruption of prison farms. Much of the film's story and technique would influence later prison movies. So I think that that's, you know, Kenny, when you're talking about the action scenes they pulled off in 1932, uh, I wanted to make sure I got that note about how influential it is, because it does kind of feel like, in the way that, uh, you guys have both seen Fablemans, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. In the way that Fableman's kind of points out like Steven Spielberg watching that train crash in the great train robbery and going, Oh my God, I got to do that. Like that's, I need to figure that out. There is so much about, I am a fugitive from a chain gang, even though it is not as much a part of the Canon as some of the other films that we're talking about in this podcast. You do feel like watching it at so many moments, you see an entire generation of filmmakers like a Scorsese, like a whomever watching this film and coming away and going, I got to figure out how to do that. And what the yeah. that is in this movie is so many things. 
you just you know that there are so many people who went on to make great films who that ending moment where he whispers i steal you're like yeah people have been chasing that their whole careers you know who i feel like really uh probably love this movie and i feel like a lot of his movies are chasing this is a filmmaker me and kenny both really appreciate and love which is not i guess it's kind of cool now it's come around but uh clint eastwood yeah oh yeah this feels like a lot of the things clint at least at least post like 90s on when he started getting serious with filmmaking and wasn't just doing shit like a good movie i like honky tonk man but like he wasn't just doing like pink cadillac and shit it was like all right, I'm I'm trying to make important movies that are still like fun to watch. Like this this feels very much like he's going for like Mystic River or uh Changeling in particular feels mm-hmm. very much like he was chasing something with this. So, you know, I'm sure it yeah, definitely so many people definitely were fucking chasing this. I'm sure Don Siegel chased this and you know, all all sorts of guys. I mean, yeah, Kenny, the end of that movie is it really is something else. <laughs> I was watching it. I didn't even really know what to expect from the movie, but I'm watching this ending. I'm like, oh, wow, they're just chucking dynamite at the guys that are chasing them. This is like, they're not treating it like a movie where it's like, oh, they got to escape, but they're going to do it in like a heroic way. It's like, no, they're, they're just straight up throwing bombs at these guys and they're going to blow up a bridge. And his friend just got machine gunned down and is dying on the side of the road. Like, this is yeah. a messy... Un- unfriendly experience for everyone involved. I love a a, a good prison break movie, a uh, prison escape movie. Love. Yeah. I mean, who 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 doesn't? That's not what this is. This no. is this, there's so much desperation in this movie. And then I mean the just from a from a you know visceral kind of pleasure center of watching really exciting shit standpoint. You know, I didn't know there were two escapes. So you think at the end of this film, <laughs> yeah, I. You, you, you think at the end of this film, and I we're skipping around. I implore your listeners just watch this movie, just watch it. You won't regret it. Like, it's on HBO Max, easy to find. You guys can watch it. It's the it's one of the easiest watches you'll ever see. Like it gets into the grooves of your brain. You feel better about yourself. It is kind of shocking that um that they you know look. I was looking it up because I did tried did the a modicum of research for this that. Yeah, chain gangs were going strong in the South until 1955. Yep. And then they brought them back. Yeah. And they, they, you know, I think technically you can still do it in Arizona. But the chain gang, chain, the, the, you know, the, the chain gangs you think are like kind of almost cartoonish with the guys wearing the prison stripes on the side of the road. That was a real thing uh, when this movie took place in the 20s and, you know, when this movie was made in the 30s. It, so from a learning about America standpoint, it's amazing. And then from a character standpoint, it's incredible. Incredible. And from an emotional standpoint, it, it's shocking. There's some really great performances, really interesting, like um, social commentary beyond just the obvious kind of like the this prison system is nasty. There's this wild, wild line in the middle of this film where he's, you know, he has the second girlfriend. He mm-hmm. initially, Paul Mooney dates his landlady and then he dates uh, a like kind of a young ingenue type that he meets at the party. And she says, what does she say? She says, I'm free, white, and 21. There are no musts in my life. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, it's, it's really a, 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 you know, kind of a wonderful experience from, from, from front, front to back uh, now that we're 90 years later and there are no more changing. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I didn't know what to expect from this movie either, like I said. And my, I didn't know there was going to be two escapes either because my assumption was – Oh, this is based on a true story. It's based on a book that this guy wrote. Obviously, he must have escaped. And by the time they're getting to the pardons, I'm like, oh, he must get off. Like, they must, like, just let him go. And then he goes back to prison. I'm like, wait, what? And then he fucking escapes again. And I'm like, okay, now this must be when it sticks. And then it ends with him drifting into the shadow saying, I steal. And it ends. I'm like, what the fuck is this? This is crazy. You you know what the thing is though it's like it's it makes you think about the whole scope of Hollywood and the whole scope of how these stories were told right so this falls into like this category social problem pictures right um and again these are things I didn't really know I didn't really know this until I, I started researching that this is the this is the gold standard mm-hmm. uh my under, now my understanding is you know people who aren't about to do a podcast about this movie um have acknowledged that this is the gold standard of these social problem movies that Warner Brothers and Columbia put out in the 30s. And 
you can trace it you can trace it all the way to today i mean what what's a what's a more a recent social problem picture but uh anything about a, a social problem like the one that was cited in the thing i read was the good lie um the reese witherspoon movie you know and yeah. and a uh, gentleman's agreement is a social problem movie. Yeah. I'd say in the heat of the night, when you when you were saying which director was the first guy, I thought was was you know Norman Jewison yeah. does this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, um, uh, over and over again, up to ninety nine Hurricane was a essentially a social problem. I don't remember, but whatever, it's a well, social problem. I mean, movie. well, to kind of you know the way there's like so many things baked into this, it's you know jumping off the line where that you brought up. I I think one of the most striking moments in the movie to me is in his first incarceration and he's planning his escape. He sees the big black guy hammering and he's like, what? Like, like that's a big guy. And his friend's like, yeah, they're never going to let he's him go. Out of yeah. here. He's the, they're, they're going to make sure he never gets out, which is just oh. such a low key way to be like, yeah, this is like, this sucks for the white veteran. So imagine what it's like for a big fucking black motherfucker of a guy who can hammer all day and not feel tired they're like yeah this guy's not a he's human too valuable he's, the team well yeah, it's yeah. like he's too valuable. they're gonna franchise him but and then and then and then also just again which what feels kind of different for the time it was made is that when he goes up to the guy and is like hey hammer my chain so i can break free they don't paint the guy like an imbecile or like a stereotype or like he was like some guy's fucking servant when he wasn't oh yeah master i'll i'll, I'll have me it's just like uh you sure you want to do that i mean i might yeah. break your feet uh He's all right yeah okay Duncan in, in the green mile which you know shows how far we've fallen he's another well, prisoner that's what i was gonna say you know oh, it's something... fast. i remember what i was real fast. i remember what i was yes, gonna say it's... all i wanted to say was uh pre-code because there's a pre-code movie in the 30s um you're not going to find a lot of quote-unquote hollywood endings yeah and yeah. as we move forward you know a movie like this to tom's point it 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 it, it is bo- it, there was a cognitive dissonance i had watching the end of this film which was is this movie going to have a happy ending right they they hinted this idea that this guy paul paul mooney's character is named james allen is this you know not that he's brilliant or that he's you know exceptional in any way, but that he's you know he's a he's a good worker, a smart guy, and a, a good citizen, and has proven to be you know a valuable citizen uh, when he escaped prison the first time and lived under a, an assumed name. And he makes a deal, or his lawyers make a deal to get him pardoned uh, after doing ninety days, and then ultimately they go back on the deal, um, which leads to his second escape. Uh, you know, there's there's another it made made me start thinking that. After probably the code came in, and more or less up until today, you know, in terms of Hollywood films or big films, there's been this basic uh, thing where part of the goal of a social message movie or a social problem movie is ultimately the system can be trusted. Ultimately, you are going to find that judge who's decent and who is going to listen to the truth and the facts. And it's going to reward the, you know, the defense attorney who's representing the black guy who, um, who, you know, is wrongfully accused. And I feel like you see that over and over again, including movies like, you know, the hurricane where that's a true story and all that, but that, it, you know, that's the movie they decide to make and not the movies about the hundreds of thousands of black guys who are, you know, incarcerated, you know, be, beyond, you know, the, the term or whatever. So I, it was really jarring at the end to see a, a movie that is so distrusting of systems not just the system oh, yeah. the prison system not just the 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 judicial system also you know church yeah initially my first like the the first instinct i had is his brother is a priest who comes or a minister i don't know um i'm a jew uh he <laughs> comes to he comes to the house and basically shames paul mooney after he comes back from the war into uh taking this job at a local factory instead of following his dreams of getting into you know construction and engineering and all i can think god these fucking clergymen are garbage all they're doing is just you know insinuating themselves in other people's lives to maintain the status quo what is going on here so i i thought that was really kind of amazing and refreshing and yeah there's a there's kind of a i mean uh, hell even even the military gets 
gets you know in its own yeah. subtle way that it, this guy comes back from the great war and he's basically relegated to being nothing. a wandering bum he has not if he wants anything it's to stay at home with his mother under the watchful eye of his dickhead priest brother and go work at a dead end factory job if he wants to chase his own dreams he's basically got to be a bum and hope for a lucky break the yeah, lucky breaks just so so happens to be when he's escaped from jail and comes upon a road crew that actually listens to his suggestions and like, hey, you know what you're talking about. Let's start promoting you. And, you know, just that almost cosmic sense of like how bitterly cynical this movie is. Like the only good break that happens to this guy comes with a fucking noose above his head. Just like, yeah, but any wrong turn, this this good break is going to be your downfall, which essentially it is and refreshing to see a movie whether it's then or now that's so brutally cynical about the systems that be e even today you know with movies trying to reckon with oh the, the systems are bad the systems are bad we'll still get movies that are trying to be social movies and that people that think they're socially minded tend to like you know, I don't know why, but the a movie that came to mind when you were talking about all of that, Kenny, was um, Promising Young Woman. Mm -hmm. Because that is a movie who's the... like That's for social nine problem movie. But yeah, but for nine-tenths of the movie, it's saying the system's bad, her friend got raped, and they, nobody cared, and she killed herself, so Carrie Mulligan has to take care of it. But then how does it end? It the ends, police it, are going to solve yeah. all the problems. Which is weirdly so disheartening to watch a movie even today that so-called liberals can watch and be like yeah that really upended the th this kind so, of movie and you go no it didn't I, I, actually that's an interesting one uh that's a perfect example because you know the story of that film is that emerald Fennell wrote that ending with wrote that movie with a different ending with the right end with carrie mulligan dying and you know uh and no fucking revenge from the grave thing. And after she got it financed and after I think they shot it, or maybe I, I don't think they shot it. After she had written it, uh, the, the financiers insisted that she had this, let's call it a happy ending. Um, and she put this on to the end. And that's what got made. And that's what, you know, won her fucking Oscar. But it's, it goes, it, it's, the, the, the rot is so deep when it comes to what we're talking about right now. Like yeah. this, this, the, the rot is so deep that even when you have people like Elmore Fennell, which, you know, coming out and basically, you know, planting her flag and being like, no, the only appropriate end the ending for this movie is that one woman can't change the system uh, in a world where she can be murdered at almost any step of the, at any step of the way. Um, and to have someone be like, oh, but maybe she's the one who can. It's, it's, it's depressing. And so I don't really, you know, I think that movie, I have more sympathy for that movie because I, I I'm aware of, of of what the intention was, and I do think it's a victim of this like kind of like chronic adherence to this notion of like in America things will turn out right eventually. Well, I was gonna. Say, it kind of almost gets to a you know an even deeper sense of the changing of the times in terms of Hollywood, you know, because at the time this was made. You had a guy who would run the studio and you would have a guy who would make a decision and whether these guys would end up being right or not, they would try to make the movie the best it could be. And they were like, this is how it, this is the best way to make the movie. Now, even on an independent movie like Promising Young Woman, you don't have that. You have a conglomerate of accountants who see a movie like that with a depressing ending and go, well, let's tack on a happier ending instead to let people know that, well, the systems are okay because, well, we're all accountants. We're all a part of the system. We're not trying to rock the boat too much. So it really kind of goes to all what we're saying is, is that maybe we shouldn't let a hundred different people with different ideas who aren't filmmakers make movies. I don't know. I mean, I think that's part of it, but I also think that the bigger issue with all of this uh, and with how we process art and film in general is that some of these early pre-code films, these issue films, things like that, require 
the audience to to be self critical and to have a uh, a sense of self awareness and self reflection and we don't really want to do that as audiences now like the the audience in general like i think that a movie you know the the reason why you get movies that have to force either a happy ending or at least a conclusion is that when we make social issue movies now it's for people to show up and feel like they are on the right side of the issue and it is to yep. reinforce that they are on the right side of the issue and to suggest that there is a right side to the issue. One of the things that makes I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang so compelling and so many of these movies so compelling is that while, yes, it is fair to say that I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang is an indictment of the system, the other issue that it confronts that so many of these movies don't want to now is, you know, I, I think part of it is, we talked about this in season one with a movie that feels very similar as Best Years of Our Lives, which also deals with veterans coming home, and how in those eras, those movies were going out of their way to point to the people in the audience and say, this is you, you are the people that are mistreating these people. And anything after that, even after the code falls apart, like you watch those 70s films, that are seemingly all about the system and the man. And they basically treat it as like, well, no, no, man, you're, it's us. We're the good guys. It's the system that's broken. And the thing that Fugitive from a Chain Gang gets so well, and the thing I think we have to reconcile with now and we don't, is that more than just the system, it doesn't matter if you dismantle the American prison system, the American justice system, dismantle America in general, our culture and our time and us as people are unforgiving and vindictive. And the main core of the American justice system remains something that is unforgiving and vindictive. We tell ourselves this lie all the time, the idea that, you know what, the whole idea is the system exists, you serve your time, and then once you serve your time, that's it. Like, it's an even exchange. But like this movie shows and so many movies kind of show, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We would like to tell ourselves that if Paul Muni can prove that he's a benefit to society, then he shouldn't go to jail. But instead, we're like, no, 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 he's got to go back. He's got to go back. He's got to serve his full time because that's the deal. Yeah. And it's, we are, I mean, even now, you know, uh, when you look at the, the internet discourse and the conversation, even amongst people who claim to be very progressive in their views, right? I feel like so often you hear somebody turn around and go, hey, a guy shouldn't go to jail for that. A guy shouldn't go to jail for that. It's like, okay, but that's a thing you don't actually care about. When it's an issue that you think a person is wrong and you have a problem, you're just as vindictive. You're just as, you know, half the, half the guys you hear online who are very vocal about prison abolition, it sounds like they just want to go straight to firing squads instead. So there is a vindictiveness to the way that we view justice in this country. And I well, think that that's... that's what this movie addresses too. That's that's I mean, that's maybe the, the most brilliant stroke of the movie. And honestly, kind of the luck of the story that's being told is that. The whole the system is trying to say, well, no, we're trying to reform these men. This isn't a punishment. This isn't barbaric. They're, their whole spiel. And. They have the perfect example of that. Oh, Paul that's, Muni. That, that was shocking. It was brilliant. Like he is all the proof they need to say, well, look, see. He may have escaped and did something wrong, but he's become a benefit to society because of what we did to him. It wasn't the army. It was working for on the chain gangs. But because the system isn't about reformation, it's about punishment. They will not let this guy get away with throwing egg in their face. They are going to lie and cheat to get this fucking guy back and then throw him into an even worse chain gang just to say, Fuck you. This isn't about reformation where we just want to punish you fucks and get free labor out of you. That's it. That's the brilliant stroke of the movie without ever telling you that was the theme that all you have to watch is if you just think about it, you're like, wait, he I mean, he is the poster child for the system works, but they don't let him go. They, they have to keep 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 punishing him. It's crazy. And it's even crazier, too, is that as another little, as a way of also digging the system, he almost does get away with it because he is a successful white guy. 
Mm -hmm. That's another unspoken thing of just if he was a black guy who made a little bit of success in like, you know, Harlem or whatever, they wouldn't have given a shit if he made money in Harlem. But because he was a white boy in Chicago who did some good. Oh, well, this is a travesty. He's saying the chain gangs are bad. Look at what he's done for the community. He's got such a nice girl. Let's do let's do right by him. And you well, go, yeah, but, well, but of course, and this is, you know, and I think this kind of speaks to everything you guys are saying. Uh, we have the benefit of seeing his whole story. So, you know, we, we know this guy didn't really do anything. Um, yeah. We know he was a, a, a desperate guy who was forced into at gunpoint into, you know, being a part of a robbery. So we're bought into the, we're all bought into him from the beginning. But it's interesting because the, the story you just told, Tom, at every kind of turn in that story is a is an entry point for someone to come in and make a comment about this story. Right. Who doesn't take into the context into 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 account the context of this man's life or the actual circumstances. And uh, that's what we see a lot. We see a lot of it, willful ignoring of the actual, you know, scope of a story, and then furthermore, a lack of ability to acknowledge that you can't possibly know the whole story. You know, so there's always this uh, this assumption that we know the whole story, what was reported, even that, but you never really do. Um, and then you get even further down the line of, you know, to some extent of uh, who are we to cast judgment uh, versus living in a, a society of rule and law. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's all very thorny, but. And then even more so, you know, the question of when do we apply it? Right. And like Tom's pointing out the conversation about, Oh, he's a good part of the community. I mean, you know, the angle of this film toward the end of what happens to Paul Muni's character, right. Where he is, you know, and we're jumping around of course, but where he is offered a deal, right. The judge and the justice system turns around and says, we have determined your punishment. Your punishment will be, you're not going back to, it's 90 days of a clerical job. That's the deal. That's what it is. We've decided that that's justice. And then the justice system and, you know, the people in power decide to renege on that deal, right? And welch on that deal and back out. And so he's like, oh, I got screwed here. Like, you told me it was one thing and it's not. And he flees. And now the movie, you know, has us looking at Paul Muni's character and going, he got screwed. Of course he should flee right? Like the system, you know, screwed him over. Here's the thing. Like you said, Kenny, we know he didn't do anything, right? And everybody watching I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang sits down and goes, hey, listen, they told him it was one thing, then they changed their minds. So he took off. Anybody would do it. That's the right thing to do. Okay. But like you said, if you don't have the whole picture, the whole story, that's also in a sense, and we talked about it on a previous episode, it's also, in a sense, the tail end of the Roman Polanski story. And there's far fewer people who will sit down and go, yeah, that guy's in the right. He got screwed. No, like, we understand there's more to it in so many directions, but, like, we can kind of cherry pick certain things. You know, and by that, I'm referring to, of course, you know, the whole thing the judge said, hey, you go to this facility, and if they say that you're medically well, no jail time, and then the judge went, actually, no, we're going to send him to prison. So he takes off. Now, obviously, we look at that, and, and, you know, it's not necessarily the same conversation of like, well, the justice system's really railroading a guy because many people, you know, are the opinion. What? Wait a second. For some people it was. Yeah. Right. I mean, but that's kind of the thing, you know, it's yeah. just a matter of it, at the end of the day, like, like you're talking about with this film, like we are following Paul Muni's story from the beginning. Right. And how, you know, so we know that he's, he didn't do anything wrong, but if we don't have all the facts, like so much of what determines whether or not somebody goes to jail is whether we socially want them to be in jail. You know what I mean? Like there's a level of. I think, I think it's, uh, it's interesting. And uh, I think the movie, but it knows we're following Paul Muni. So we know he's innocent. So we know he doesn't deserve any of this. Yeah. But I do think by, spending a little bit of time humanizing the other prisoners but also them like doesn't one of them say like oh yeah i killed three people yeah. i was yeah. i was trying to beat this guy's record like we all we know that the guys he's with did do crimes they did do horrible things and yet by seeing the conditions that these guys have to live in that we're following a man who was in the fucking Great War, who fought in the trenches of Europe, 
the nastiest, dirtiest goddamn war that ever existed, that even this guy says, this is too much, this is inhumane, I'm getting the fuck out of here, how do we allow people to live like this? And by having murderers in the room with him, we're, we're still like, yeah, I know this guy's like a mass murderer and shit, but fuck, this is not a good thing to do. That's that's kind people. of what I that's kind of what I I mean too to that degree is like, you know, because the character is wholly innocent in the film, right? Because Muni is just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like now obviously like that works for the film because it is conveying like you'll get screwed even if you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I do think that like you're saying Tom, you know, the way that it evokes the other version a lot it's it's very easy for people to watch elements of the story of Paul Muni's character and go well, that's objectively wrong. And it's like, well, is it still objectively wrong if you think the person's a bad person? You know, like, let's say you think that Paul Muni actually yeah. killed somebody. You know, um, and the thing that makes that interesting, you know, Tom, earlier on in a different context, you mentioned Gone with the Wind, right? Yeah. I talk about Gone with the Wind a lot with people whenever they find out I'm a big movie person, because I always say, like, have you seen it? And most times I hear no, because it's uh, a, a bad movie that says racism's okay. And I'm like, you know, the thing about Gone with the Wind is, while there are a lot of problematic elements, I always go back to the fact that because nobody watches it, you know, nobody really knows this, but the fact that there is explicitly, in a 1939 hit movie, a scene where Scarlett O'Hara goes to a prison and starts buying up cheap prison labor because, well, this can replace the slaves, and then Rhett Butler shows up and choose her out for it, going, you're just making prisoners into new slaves. Like, that, when you see that shit in 1939, and you watch this, you know, I'm a future machine gang, it is this thing where you, you feel like, you feel like Mark Ruffalo in Spotlight, you just want to yell, like, they knew! We've known this! Yeah. We've known this for fucking decades! Like, everybody now in, in you know, in, in New York and L.A. who bought their copy of the new Jim, Jim Crow and read it on public transit to tell everybody, like, well, no, see, I'm learning this new information. We've known since the 30s. At the very least, like, we have proof here. We knew that's, this explicitly that's, since the 30s. That's, that's, that's one of the craziest things, man, of watching how, like, like Kenny said before, we've, we've honestly gotten worse, yeah. which is that we have known this, that the prison system is bad for almost 100 years now just in film. Films telling us that prison is bad. And yet we still have a wide swath of the population going, well, we need prisons. Prisons is how we Don't punish the bad prisons. people. That's, you know, that's what we need to do. And you go, but if you want less, like, no, that's not, we, how do you connect, like watching, like, these are the same kind of people that, only watch like Shawshank Redemption and shit, and they don't really connect well, I, the two. I want to talk about Shawshank too. Uh, and it's but just what was, in your opinion, Paul Mooney's biggest transgression in the eyes of the quote unquote law? Well, that he that he escaped. I would say it's that he wrote the fucking op. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's it. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's it. I, I, he, I mean, you're, right, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yes, of course. That he exposed the system. So that, yeah, and and that and and that speaks to everything we're saying. Yeah. And which is, you know, he got this ultimate punishment because he actually spoke out against the conditions in the prison. And any other any other ending of this movie would have been disingenuous at that point, because that's the, the point the movie's making. Now, almost every other fucking prison movie, particularly from like the 80s on, uh, in some way, they, they end in, in, in a happy way. Now, look, I have to preface by saying Shawshank Redemption was my favorite movie when I was, you know, a 12 year old. and is a uh, extremely important movie in my life, right? I, I would say more than almost any movie, it was the one that was like, oh, this is what we can do. I really want to make movies like this. And it started me on my journey. Uh, and Shawshank Redemption isn't the worst offender, and uh, I still consider it a great movie. But Red gets out because he convinces a panel of assholes that he deserves to get out. He, a black he, guy. The same, yes, the, it's the same garbage that we get from every other movie, which is uh, deep down, these bureaucrats who are you know part of this system that incarcerates people, primarily people of color, will come around if you just you know tell them the truth in an eloquent way, um, yep. or plead your case in an eloquent way. 
It's and... funny because I love the Shawshank Redemption too, one of my favorite movies. But even when I was younger watching it, that ending, that ending bit always rang false to me. It's like, wait, so he's just an asshole to these guys, but he's telling the truth. So they're like, well, gee, gee, Willikers, we got to let this guy go. It's, I'm like, I, I, I don't know about that, guys. I like, you know, I, I know corrections officers, and I know people that work in the system. They, they don't work like that this is odd and he's black like they're not they're not listening to a black guy for one minute so yeah the the whole i mean the 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 implicit argument the implicit argument of that is red quote unquote did it the right way right red waited his 20 25 years he was eligible for parole he 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 pled his case to the parole parole board and got out because you know he had been rehabilitated by the system even though his whole point was i wasn't rehabilitated but that i think that was you know that that was him negging the system and they're like, oh, no, we think you are. L- listen to the way. You- so that's and, and then the other movie that, you know, is essentially the same plot of this film, or at least the same thematic plot is a movie called Murder in the First. You guys remember that movie? Mm-hmm. Christian, uh, Christian Slater. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's the same basic idea. He's uh, who was who's the Kevin Bacon was in jail for stealing five dollars from a uh, post office to like buy to like or stealing a candy bar from a post office something ridiculous federal crime goes to alcatraz kills a guy in alcatraz because the system ruined him at the end of the day they convince the system that the system's bad and, and he gets off i i i'm not saying it's impossible there are certainly cases like brown versus board of head where the system said you know what we really are bad and we really <laughs> should change but for the most part it's the opposite. It's Plessy versus Ferguson. You know, for the most part, it's the, it's the, um, is that the one? Or no, it's, 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 no, I sound like an idiot. Is Plessy versus Ferguson the one where that was, where, where racism was upheld on the, uh, what's separate but equal, you mean? Yes. Yes. All right, cool. For the most part, it's that. We're bad, we're, 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 we're corrupt systems are upheld by, uh, well, you know, it's, I, I, it's funny because I I'd read a uh, an interview with Frank Darabont recently. It was for it was an oral history on the mist, and he was talking about you know the big thing about the mist is the ending. It's the bleakest ending that's ever been filmed. One and of my like, favorite fucking endings ever. It's the best. It's um seeing that opening night in a movie theater, a packed movie theater, was unbelievable. But he was talking about like yeah, you know, I was the guy who made Shawshank and Green Mile, and I'm you know I'm the guy who made the happy ending movies. But like he even said like. You have to build the ending to the kind of story you're telling. It's like Shawshank and Green Mile, those are popcorn movies. Those are movies that are meant to entertain and just, you know, make people feel good. That's not The Mist. The Mist is a movie that's supposed to make you feel miserable. So I can give Shawshank a pass because, one, it's not a true story. It's kind of a parable or whatever. But when you're getting into, like, true story kind of stuff, I do agree that it's a disingenuous to tell the stories where the system works. Because that's not how it works 99% well, it us, of the it time. It makes us feel good, right? It makes us feel good. It makes us feel like in the end of the day, we're living in a just society. And, you know, the, uh, the arc of justice always bends towards right. But it, it's, I don't know, that doesn't feel right to me. And even if it is true, the, the opposite end of that coin, the opposite side of that coin is, uh, is so rarely, the stories are, are so rarely told. In fact, I can't think of a lot right now. I can't think of a lot that have the uh, movies about the prison system that have this kind of bleak ending, ending, like ending. They're obviously, for instance, in, in Shawshank, there's the guy who can get Tim Robbins off, who comes, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The guy who comes with the information that, that his old cellmate was the actual guy who killed the, the, the tennis pro, whatever. Um, and he's murdered in the courtyard. Yeah, that's, that's a bleak moment in a movie that otherwise says, you know, do your time and you'll get out and you'll go to Zewantanejo. Uh, again, love this film. Just saying. I can't think of, a, <laughs> can't think of another movie that, that really ends a prison film like this. Maybe Escape from Alcatraz? Because it's kind of like, yeah, they, they probably died. <laughs> maybe Because uh, they'd, maybe... Rather, they'd rather die than spend another fucking day in Alcatraz. <laughs> I mean, I just... Maybe Dead Man Walking, but I, I do think the, I think the idea is his soul is redeemed. I, I think... I think the idea is death penalty works sorry Mike. no i i just think that that's part of the problem like because the other thing is you know one of the one of the reasons i think that i'm a fugitive from a chain gang is so effective right 
is that at the at the end of the day, while we can talk about the larger societal indictments that it has, its most pointed critique is going, the chain gang system is brutal and inhumane, right? The chain gang system is brutal and inhumane, and it got a lot of people to go, oh, oh, holy shit, this is bad. And it reminds me of, you know, an example that it gave, uh, if you read up on the book itself, the book that he wrote, I Am a Fugitive from a Georgia Chain Gang, uh, it talks about how important that book was, as well as the film, in changing perceptions. And it evokes, the article I was reading evoked two other American books that changed our perception, and it evokes Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, both of those books were books that addressed, in the larger sense, massive systemic issues in America. Nobody is going to argue that Uncle Tom's Cabin solved racism. It most certainly did not. But one thing it did achieve was it helped jumpstart a massive abolition movement in America where everybody that read that book and encountered Simon Legree went, Jesus Christ, this can't keep going on. And I think that the reason why maybe there aren't a lot of modern prison films that have that bleak ending, part of it is we in America are having a big struggle. I mean, if you look at our cinematic history, right? I mean, you know, everybody talks about 70s movies, right? And everybody's like, the oh, 70s, best decade for movies, best this and that. In the 70s, there were a fuck ton of cops committing extrajudicial executions and the Dirty Harrys and the, all of that shit. And part of that was because the vibe at the time was kind of the opposite. The vibe in America at the time was them feeling like, well, crime has gotten rampant. We've gotten way too lenient. We've gotten way too X, Y, Z. And that kind of happens. And it's a thing that we forget is that as a society, we are desperate to have some kind of justice system, right? And the debate around, like, when you make the debate all or nothing, Right. And when you make the debate of like, well, we shouldn't have we shouldn't have cops and we shouldn't have prisons. We shouldn't have this and we shouldn't have that. You're going to have a huge swath of America that hears that and does not actually do the required reading afterward of like, oh, well, this is what we could actually do as an alternative. And instead just goes, well, that would be anarchy, you know, and it creates. So I think that part of why this movie is so effective and was so effective when it came out was because it was just very direct about, yes, it indicts society as a whole and explains how did we get to this point. But it does also point to a very specific uh, aspect of the criminal justice, the chain gang, and go like, but we can all agree this is, this is yeah. not okay. And I think that that's, I mean, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, you mentioned Dead Man Walking, Kenny, right? I think that there have been movies that have tried to tackle the death penalty in a similal fashion. You know, I mean, there was what? What? The, now I'm forgetting the title of it. What is that terrible movie with Kevin Spacey? Um, um the life of David Dale. David Dale. Yeah, life of David like there's Dale, been a bunch yeah. of those, horrible yeah. fucking movie. But there's been a bunch of those that try and tackle, you know, the death penalty, and that's a dicier conversation. But like, there, there at least, you know, there's an attempt in some ways to kind of turn around and go like, yeah, but we can all agree this is maybe a bridge too far, right? And I think that that's where this movie most succeeds. Is yes, it is. It, it, what it lays out is it kind of lays out the building blocks in the justice system, the prison system, the church, how we failed our veterans, all these things to kind of go, these are all of the elements that led up to a thing that we can all agree is fucking inhuman. And that's what I think it lands that punch so well, whereas something like Shawshank, right? Um, I think about, do you remember the story Richard Pryor tells when he's, um, when he talks about Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder going to prison to film that, which movie was it where they were in jail? Yeah, Stir Crazy, Stir Crazy. Right? Stir and crazy. he talks about Gene Wilder walking around going, oh, you know, Richard, uh, some of these guys are real swell. You know, I don't know if we should have prisons. And Richard's like, nah, some of these guys should be in fucking prison, my man. Like, no, nah, that guy's, <laughs> that's what you... <laughs> Hey, Rich. Hey, hey, Gene. Don't don't walk away with that guy. Why? Because they will fuck you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, like, I think when you're trying to do like something like Shawshank or anything like that, like there are things where I, I, it becomes tougher when you're indicting the entire justice system because, like you mentioned, the thing with whether it's the ending of Promising Young Woman or anything like that, like you do want to when you're tackling the entire justice system, it is hard to get audiences on board with the idea of like. Well, this entire thing is screwed where you're like, well, what are we, what's the alternative here? And you either get a thousand like Dirty Harry style, like, well, the alternative is good cops get a gun and kill everybody. 
Or you're like, well, the alternative is, well, I have five books on anarcho syndicalism that you should read. Like, you're not, how do you actually square the circle? And I do think that one of the things that this succeeds in, and, and a lot of movies of that time, Warner Brothers, like social conscious movies, whether it's like a Little Caesar or a White Heat or any of those too, like those other gangsters, Angels with Dirty Faces, Dead End, trying to tackle one specific idea. A film this year that did, or this past year that did it really well, I thought, uh, not that like anybody but us weird freaks watched it, but uh, Netflix's Wendell and Wild, the new Henry Selleck movie. Yeah. I didn't watch it. Oh, it's, it's, it's terrific, but it, like, it very specifically and pointedly goes after the private prison system and very directly what? goes, yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah, a major plot point. It's very shocking. <laughs> it like, goes, I mean, directly. Like, it's not subtle. It's yeah. not subtle at yeah. all. It is wow. the B plot of the, the yeah, the, the A plot of this movie is about how the system fails this girl, or the main girl, but the B plot is very specifically having two characters lay out to their daughter, yes, we use the school system to create a school-to-prison pipeline so that we can profit and we make no efforts at rehabilitation. Oh but, my God. but because it's attacking that specific thing, and it's attacking that specific issue, it's a lot easier, I think, to get the audience on board for maybe such a bleak ending because there is an obvious way well, to kind of go like, Oh yeah, we should stop doing that thing well, in particular. Well, you know, it's 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 a thing we've talked about before, which is that the more specific you get, the more narrow, you know, the broader your reach is. You know, by focusing specifically on this, it's able to deftly talk about, you know, the army, the 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 church, you know, all 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 of the shit we've been talking about by focusing specifically. I think you're right. By focusing specifically on this and this one guy you see how all of the systems that he's a part of basically fuck him, how it allows this kind of system to grow. And, you know, I think a lot more movies could learn a a thing or two by being specific. Be specific in your intent. Don't try to bite off more than you can chew. Because if you hone in on one thing, everything else is going to kind of come out with it. If, you know, so... Yeah, I think yeah, if, I think you're you, right. If you look at you know for in this particular circumstance, uh, nineteen let's say 1930 prison system. If you look at it as a spectrum, somewhat you know more or less humane to completely inhumane, chain gangs fall at the end of this inhumane thing, right? Mm-hmm. Now it's talking about the it, it's talking about the entire prison system. This film we've talked about it for the last hour, but what this film accomplishes, and I think this is you know speaks to what you're saying, Tom is, you know, there's a, the tagline from this movie, at least now, or it is, 6 6 Dynamite that blasted his way to freedom and awoke America's conscience. And I think there's this idea of, all right, so you, if this movie is successful, which it seems like it was, you know, to some extent, in, ha- in getting people to have this conversation and eventually abolishing this practice most places, you chop off the end of this spectrum. Now the middle is somewhere else, and we, you actually get this incremental change towards something that's more humane. Uh, now, I don't know if we're there. I, I haven't been in a prison lately. But, uh, <laughs> no not, but people aren't on chain gang. So, you know, there, there obviously has been some level of incremental change towards the more humane treatment of prisoners. Uh, so I hear you on that. I, I you know, the, the other part of me says, there is another part of me. This goes back to something we were talking about a little earlier and just in terms of who the audience is and what really is the point of, of preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> Ultimately, you know, it, with a book like Uncle Tom's, Tom's Cabin, I get the sense at least that at the time people were more apt to take a chance to read something outside of their comfort zone and have their minds changed. And I think this was probably true in 1930 as well, when there just weren't that many movies and something like this that, you know, has a that awake awoke that awakes or awoke in America's conscience. Uh, has some people who aren't, you know, kind of already on board. These days, it's extremely hard to get an audience who isn't already bought in to watch something that that attempts to promote incremental change. And furthermore, and I think this is another thing you're talking about, Mike, early on, it's almost impossible to point the finger, finger at the audience that actually shows up the way you were talking about this before, which, you know, my sense is, a sen- is, is, is essentially I think you you know you you socialists can can get on board with this. 
there's about a 50 percent of the percent of the country that we should just ignore more or less 48 percent of the country that that we can more or less ignore they are not going to engage in these conversations in fact having the conversation will likely put push them more in the other direction that 52 percent are in many ways the people who are maintaining the status quo there are many, in many ways, the people who, you know, the NIMBY people, the things, the same things like that are maintaining the status quo, rich liberals. And I, you know, I, I say that as a somewhat rich liberal are a big part of the problem uh, right now and are not willing. And I, again, say this to someone who's not willing to really look at myself in the mirror and say, uh, how exactly are you going to be part of the change? And I, you know, I think this is something that, that we've been discussing this whole podcast. I think this is something that's happening in the you know, in, in, in the movie, I think it's an interesting kind of aspect that this movie only got pushed through because Daryl Zanuck was like, uh, on, you know, we're doing this yeah. film the way that, that it comes out. So, you know, he's championing this at one, at, 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 you know, on, on one hand, but additionally, you know, certainly as a, uh, a rich and he wasn't Jewish, he's the only guy who wasn't Jewish. So a rich, you know, studio head in 1930, very few people in the world benefited from cheap labor the way he did you know, benefited from exploitation the way he did. It's interesting. I do think that, you know, considering we're only really speaking to about 50, 52, 55, maybe 60% of the population, the next wave has to be hard attacking the people who are at least listening and willing to change. I don't know if I necessarily, and this is where I think we run into trouble uh, when we talk about anything uh, that deals with how to change this country or shape this country, which is, you know, uh, first of all, even suggesting that there are, it seems like sometimes even suggesting that there are people that can be reached and can be changed is now a centrist position to some degree. I think that the difficulty is, you know, we're talking about this film and how it addresses chain gangs, right? It addresses one particular issue and says, I need to reform this one thing, right? Well, no, I mean, I think, I think it's addressing everything. But I'm saying, right? but I, I'm I saying that- I do yeah. think that it's pointing out this one particular thing as, as you said, isn't this something we can all agree that's with? that's what I'm saying is it's more the idea of like if if this movie you know provoked a, a massive overhaul of the entire justice system great but I do think this movie is is content with the idea of like we have to at the very least we have to fix this fucking thing and I do think that when it comes to reaching an audience and trying to to switch really, yes I think we all need to be more introspective right it's something I'm trying to do it's something that I think we all need to do as as viewers is be more introspective but I don't think you can necessarily do that if you are also in the position that, well, about 50% of these people are just dead wrong and I will never reach them and they're, and they're dead to me. Because I do think that something that this, you know, something we've seen, especially in the last 20, 30 years, is people just digging in their goddamn heels and being like, I know what I believe and I, nothing is going to change that and no new information you can to me, present to me can change that. And where that becomes challenging, especially in a conversation like this, when you're dealing with something like justice and the concept of justice and reform and criminal justice, is that, for example, everybody wants to be high-minded and believe, uh, for example, what is supposed to be the tenet of our justice system, which is innocent until proven guilty. Everybody thinks that's a great idea. Almost nobody sticks to it. Absolutely fucking nobody sticks to it. The idea that, you know, most people, if they're talking in the abstract and you go, well, wouldn't you uh, rather 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man be in jail? They'll go, why, of course, that's the moral stance to have. And then you go, here's 10 guilty men. They're all going to walk. They go, fuck no, absolutely not. Lock them up, toss them away. I think that a lot more people think that they are more enlightened than they are and i think that that's really the blockage when it comes to reaching people is is just the lack of introspection more than anything else i, I mean I, I i certainly hear you and i certainly think that this is you know this is a, a disease that's that's permeated all ends of the of the political spectrum but i i think that something new and different and weird and gross has happened for instance only until 10 years ago you know there was really no such thing as a national trans rights. And now there is. And there was some success, you know, at least pushing uh, people more in the you know direction of acceptance up until uh, maybe a couple of years ago when people have now kind of gotten to their camps. And the camp that is 
offended by the notion of trans rights isn't just keeping the status quo. They haven't listened to the arguments. And they're doing things like outlawing transition, transitional drugs, doing things like outlawing, you know, trans girls from playing uh, sports, doing things that were never had that, that, that never existed before because they're pushing even harder in the other direction. I don't really want to like, I'm not trying to disagree with you, but I do think the situation is different than it used to be. I do think before, you know, there, there was this idea, for instance, there was a, I don't know, a 40 year old battle for gay marriage and now gay marriage is kind of codified and most people agree with it. You know, most people are comfortable with it and people have mostly moved on from this fight because people have mostly accepted that this is, you know, fair and equal and decent. Uh, what's happening with trans people is just not the same. And my sense is it's because people have taken such offense to the notion that they could possibly be wrong and, you know, about anything when it comes to this stuff. So I, I, do think, I do think that a lot of the country is unreachable. I hate to say it because that's not who I am in general. Um, but, but the last, you know, the last 12 years or, or so, I guess from the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, really has kind of destroyed me in terms of, uh, thinking that there is going to be consensus moving forward. Well, you know, it's, I, I think it's, you know, what you're saying that people just don't want to listen. I think a lot of it is, you know, I hate to be like one of those guys, but I do think social media definitely didn't help things because now everybody's got an opinion. And everybody thinks their opinion is as equal to an expert. And it's, well, you know, I heard from my my cousin's sister's boyfriend's uncle that some right. trans girl beat up a bunch of uh, black belts in a bathroom. So we need to outlaw uh, trans kids in uh, bathrooms. It's like, no, that's you're not an expert. Stop talking about this. I think it's also I don't know how we, at a certain point, I don't know when it was, you know, I'm not an expert. I'll say it out loud. I'm not an expert, but it feels like there was a, a long stretch of this country where the idea was to get better. And we have no longer reached that point. At a certain point, a large swath of the population decided, no, the best time was the 50s or the 80s or whatever. We need to get back to when things were good. Yeah. Nobody wants to progress anymore. Everybody's looking to regress. And I, I don't know how you fix that. I, it's, it's definitely a fear thing. It's definitely a lot of people seeing that if everyone gets equal rights, it's not going to be great for them because they don't have their advantages anymore. Uh, and that scares the shit out of them. But I don't, I don't know how you fix a country where, like you said, maybe 48 to 50% of the country does not want things to get better. They want things to get worse. That, 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 to me, that's the difference. That's, uh, you guys watch more old movies than any, anybody on the internet. And, when I, well, and I watch a lot of <laughs> old movies, too. And what I am always struck by, always, like I just watched Network a couple weeks ago, I'm always struck by the problems are always the same. The problems are always, it was better back then, and things are a disaster right now. Always. Um, same with, uh, I'm a fugitive from the Chanking. It's always the same. But my sense is, never before has there been such a powerful group of people who aren't just resisting change, but actively trying to roll it back. Actively, doing re actively taking regressive measures to make mar life harder for the marginalized. It, it has existed in various forms. I mean, this is the kind of thing, the more you look at American history, uh, the less surprising all of this is. You just have to take yourself out of the moment that you're living in. Obviously, the, the immediate like post-Reconstruction era is very, uh, you know, turn back the clock in America. You mm -hmm. know, Nixon employing his Southern strategy. You know, a lot of like the Reagan 80s is all that way. I mean, you know, I, Reagan, I mean, the Reagan 80s is, is, is uh, yeah, I, I, I hear you I mean, you like, there. it's, you, uh, you, people don't think, enough, like, now that we're doing so much 80s nostalgia, like, people don't think enough about how much of the Reagan 80s was 50s nostalgia. And, and I also get it in terms of, like, listen, I am deeply nostalgic for the 90s, and not because I go necessarily, like, things were better back then, even though it's hard not to be, because objectively, things were better pre-9-11. Uh, I feel like that's just the difficult thing about 90s nostalgia is like, oh, we weren't scared constantly. But, but I think what you do see when you look back is you can kind of sometimes look and go like, oh, there was a different path we could have gone. 
I do think when it comes to now, you know, I saw somebody tweet something after the midterms that I thought was so, it, it made me laugh immensely. It was somebody who just went, because we obviously, everybody's predicting a red wave, all the things say red wave, and the red wave didn't happen. We barely lost the House. We held on to the Senate under a candidate that if you went on Twitter, you would believe no, everybody hates immensely. And somebody said, they tweeted out, they go, oh, it turns out that uh, suburbanite liberalism uh, kind of does work, uh, kind of does win pe- get people out to the polls. And they were joking, they're being sarcastic, but there is that thing of like, right, there is in fact a swath of people for whom, those of us that are very plugged in can't see this, but like, uh, Tom and I talk about this sometimes that, you know, the, the thing that, that somebody like a Joe Biden has going for him the best and that is appealing to people the best is that whenever like a, a Fox News reporter tries to bait him into a discussion, his response is typically, who gives a shit? Yeah, like, come on, man. Like when the guy goes, well, how many genders are there? And he went, at least three, man. You're like, right. <laughs> this know, is who cares, man? Yeah, but like that is and that is what is actually effective when it comes to, you know, change in this country in some ways is that I think that when you're talking about reaching people or not reaching people, right? One of the things that, you know, I, I, it's, it's hack to call certain works of art preachy, right? But I do think that one of the things that I am a fugitive from a chain gang has going for it when we talked about, like, its appeal is that as much as it is a very serious and stirring film, it does kind of take that approach at many points of, like, come on, man. Like, that kind of stuff, like, come on, man. You see this. You know this is fucked up. And I do think that, like, one of the issues right now with how we deal with things is, and, and whether it's in the political conversation, the artistic conversation, any, is we are more interested in being right than being effective. We are more interested. I think that we've lost the ability to connect well, to people in terms of, like, I think that, you know, a lot of people, especially people my age, especially, I'll call out the millennial generation specifically. Uh, when I look at like 2016 as a primary and as an election and all of that, which is, I feel like a lot of people my age, when they write about politics or talk about politics or engage in politics, come from this stance of, well, I'm right. And if I'm right, then that means all I need to do is say the facts that I believe. And since I'm right, people will objectively have to recognize that I'm right. And when you go back to something like, you know, when you look at why somebody like Bill Clinton was able to win an election against the incumbent president. Part of it was he understood, okay, I need to figure out how to communicate these ideas to other people. I need to be able to actually try and reach people and try and affect something. You know, what's a a, a smart thing that this movie does is that, um, what state is uh, the chain gang in again in this movie? Is it Arkansas or is it Georgia? They don't say, but the book is Georgia. I think it's I think it's pretty clever not to yeah. say it. I mean, but that's what I'm going to say. It never says what state it's in, and it also very pointedly never says if the governor who's fucks him over in the end if he's a Republican or a Democrat. Yeah. It's just the people in power, whoever that is, and we all can be mad at the people in power, right? Take the the letter away from the end of their name, D or R. We can all get mad at them. They fuck us over every day. Just don't think about who, what, what ballot they were on. This guy fucked over an innocent man and threw him into a system that is, by all accounts, just a reskin of slavery. But this mm-hmm. time, we got the whites involved now. Isn't that horrible? Yeah. Come on, I, guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, you're, you're, and I think this kind of ties together both your points. I think your point about right versus effect is an interesting and i'm not a politician nor involved in politics in any way so i think i can stand up and and yell about what i think is right because i'm not trying to win elections but i am trying to make art and influence people through it and uh in that respect there are didactic didactic people like for instance adam mckay who just comes out and yells at you what he thinks is right imagine this movie made today dude Oh my god. It's like you know the and I think McKay in a sense is taking the lesson of this movie which is uh a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Right? Like this movie is so compelling on a narrative level um that even if you don't engage 
with the social message of it. It's an incredibly uh, invigorating experience. And I think that's what McKay is trying to do with his films uh, or his recent, you know, kind of social message films is he's trying to, you know, imbue him with so much comedy that even someone who doesn't really want to engage, but, but uh, he's doing it poorly, right? He's doing it so poorly that, that any schmuck can realize you're not being funny. You're, you're preaching at me. Yeah. I, I, so there's that. Then there, you know, there, there are other movies that I think are trying to be, as, as, you, as you say, effective. And I wonder what really has been, you know, effective. I, I would almost argue something like Succession has been very effective. I was going to say In, Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yellow, Yellowstone's a great example. Yellowstone, yeah. Because Succession, I don't know how much, you know, people with MAGA bumper stickers are watching Succession. And when we talk about right versus effective, Yellowstone is not a liberal show, right? And there are plenty of things on Yellowstone that you can come away from and go, well, that's a conservative talking point. But also, much like I am a fugitive from a chain gang, the most red state America and blue state America can watch Yellowstone. And no matter where you are on the political spectrum, there's no way you don't come away from Yellowstone going, we're really fucking the Native Americans. Yeah, we like, fucked the Native but Americans. But not just we I... fucked, we are continuing to do so. And if Taylor Sheridan is able to get people to understand that, then I don't necessarily care if he can't get every person watching Yellowstone to also care about climate change and universal health care and the 15 other talking points. Like, if you can get us there. No, no, it, it's, a great, it's a great point, Mike, and I've thought about that a lot. And, and like Mike said, everybody watches Yellowstone. Uh, it, that a show doesn't get those numbers if everybody's not watching it. You know, we watch it, and red state people watch it. My parents watch it. My parents, dipshit, flat earther friends from Florida watch it. You know, everybody watches Yellowstone. I don't think everybody's watching Succession, but I think you're po- both your you guys are kind of on the same wavelength. But I think I think Yellowstone's a great example, and I think you know I keep. Re- when people pretend like ter- like like Taylor Sheridan is some kind of conservative filmmaker, I I keep remembering this is the guy who fucking you did Hell or High Water, yeah, right? Like Wind I River, keep, I keep rem- Wind River, and then even you know even Costner to to the, the idea that he's some kind of conservative guy, he's not. I mean, he's just he's he is a very typical centrist guy, but you know he's the only se- he's the only senator who stood next to Pete, the only celebrity who stood that next to Pete Buttigieg during the campaign yeah. um and Pete Buttigieg in a lot of ways is that you know th- this ideal of what we're talking about this idea who this guy who still very much believes he can reach across the aisle and that's Costner but sitting next to the gay presidential candidate was quietly revolutionary in its own right these guys aren't sleeper cells and I think you're totally right about, about Yellowstone I think Yellowstone has probably made people understand what was stolen more than all the fucking land acknowledgments in the world which I think are the most insulting things in the universe. Have you watched Mayor of Kingstown? No. I mean, I, I've watched almost none of the Sheridan verse. Okay, well, Mayor of Kingstown fits very well into this, what we're talking about because it's all about how the prison system sucks, it turns people into animals, and it goes one step further and it says, the COs are just a gang on the same level as the prisoners, if not worse, because they have power. And the prisoners yeah. have none. And well, I should why? I mean, it, it sounds like the shield, which is the you know the, another oh, the version. The best. Yeah, but it's again, it's another one of those Sheridan things where you would watch it and go, "Oh, he's making a conservative fucking thing." But then you watch it, and you know, like Jeremy Renner will say, like shit, like yeah, I put a, I was in the white supremacist gang in prison because that's what prison does to you. It puts you into gangs. There was. We were outnumbered three to one in prison, so I did this. I left. I'm not doing that shit. Like making like it's like in fucking Ye- like in Yellowstone where Costner will be like, yeah, no, like we fucked over the Indi- the Native Americans. Like this is just what this country is. It's like like when th- I don't know, I, but I I would say Mary Kingstown. If you got hooked on this, I would say give it a shot because it's definitely playing a similar gang but, game. But to your point, Kenny, when you're talking about like, you know that that. Costner's centrism or anything like that. I do think part of it is like, you know, one of the things that I kind of have have lamented about and will lament about on this podcast again with certain movies this year and things like that is that one of the things that I do find a little exasperating is 
so often when I hear people talk about whether it's a movie or a TV show or anything where they go, it was able to get, you know, uh, Red America and Blue America together to go to the theater. That is so rarely a case where it's actually a movie that has Blue America values that got Red America to go to the theater and much more a case of how often people on the left will like twist themselves into knots to pretend that they don't like anything that has a conservative or centrist leaning. How you, often you talk about Maverick. I will talk about Maverick. I don't hate the movie at all. Um, I'm look, we're <laughs> going to talk about it on our Oscar episode. Phil is having us on to do a double feature of Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick. So I'm going to get Maverick out. But my problem is, has nothing to do with the movie itself. And in this instance, and it I, has, I know exactly. What it has more to do with the fact we were all ready. Go back three years ago, before this movie came out and we decided it saved cinema. There's not a human fucking being on the left who you could turn to and you went, you know, Top Gun, the original Top Gun, that's like a military recruitment tool. Like, that's a real right-wing jingoistic movie. They would all go, absolutely yes. And I think that it is okay. It is actually fucking okay to go to Top Gun Maverick and go see it and sit next to the guy in the MAGA hat who is having a blast and be able to acknowledge, hey, this movie is inherently jingoistic and pro-military. I'm also having a good time. It doesn't have to reflect all of my values. And instead, like, I watch people twist themselves into knots, and we're never going to get there if you can't admit that sometimes you can enjoy something that doesn't totally align with your politics. The thing I go back to a lot that kind of pisses me off immensely, um, and I, I will get off the topic soon, but do you remember Zero Dark Thirty? Of course. Or, or as Tom and I like to call it, Zero Dark Thirty, because Ted had to say that Zero at the Dark Oscars, 30. and I will never forget it. <laughs> so Zero Dark Thirty comes out, <laughs> and everybody's raving about Zero Dark Thirty, right? You remember how that was one of those Oscar movies that like people walked out and went, well, of course, it's an unimpeachable masterpiece. And then we all yes. went to see it, and we went, all right, I, I can't quite square this. And it was a tough movie to grapple with, right? Because it is a movie that is actually two movies. It is a movie that for... 75% of its runtime is a movie that's trying to be, we tortured all these people and never got them. And then for the last 25% goes, we got them. So it's a weird movie. And I remember the only thing that really transfixed me about that film was walking away from it going, huh, this is a fascinating puzzle box to reckon with in a way because the movie seems almost pro-torture. And I should have to grapple with that as a viewer. And, and kind of go with like, well, this makes me ask the question, was it all worth it? And then afterward, the entire press junket and everything, Catherine Bigelow's like, this movie is inherently anti-torture. This is bad. Torture is wrong. This and that. And it's like, okay, well, now I don't have to do any work or any soul searching. And this movie is weird and kind of formless and uninteresting now. And I think that you should have to make us... It's such an interesting point. It's such... You're, you're making a really interesting point. I, think, I actually think about that movie a lot because I, I, I think that movie's brilliant. It's one of my favorite movies of the last 20 years masterpiece and be and part of it is be, be because of what you're talking about and i i have never ever until this moment heard Catherine bigelow come out and say this movie is inherently anti-torture though i assumed it was because i know her to some extent i don't know her as a person but i know her films and she doesn't seem like the kind of person who would come out and say this and make and make a pro-torture movie regardless what the movie does and this is to your point mike that an argument that bothers me very much is the argument where people try to say, well, torture doesn't work. That's it. It's irrelevant to me. That's irrelevant when you talk about whether we should torture or not. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause then just like the, the argument that always I found relevant and really infuriating to some extent was, well, you know, uh, gay people are born that way. Irrelevant, irrelevant. Don't like, it makes no difference whether people should be able to do this, uh, do what they want, whether they're born that way or they choose. Just like it makes no difference whether we should torture people if we get good information or bad information. Just like it makes no difference whether we should kill people, whether it's a deterrent or not a deterrent. What I love about Zero Dark Thirty is, okay, torture kind of works. Now have the discussion. You know, torture kind of works. How do you feel about it now? Do you still have that point of view or are you some like creep who is ultimately like, well, wait, it, it, it doesn't adhere to my team anymore. Uh, it's, it's just, it seems uh, messed up. So, so few movies present that kind of argument to me. The argument of, yeah, no, it's, it's, it is a lot more um, gray than you're willing to say. And you don't have this, like, this, this, this undergirding of it's ineffective anyway. 
now how do you feel? I, I think that's really, really uh, effective. Your Maverick point I'm more interested in hearing. I know you're going to talk about it a lot, you said. But I, look, my, my I, yeah. I, I struggle with that movie, too. Oh, do you? Um, okay. Well, let's... well, well. Well, look, I want, I want, I want to, yeah. I want to make this very clear. I love the first Top Gun. I love the second Top Gun. I, I enjoyed them deeply, and I like started bawling at the beginning of the first to- of the second Top Gun when the music hit. Um, so it hits that that nostalgia button for me. I struggle with the same thing you struggle with, uh, the reaction to it, and I keep trying to understand why is it this film. Of all the big budget pro military epics that somehow somehow got all these people to drop all of their bullshit. Because they have, that's the way I look at it. The people dropped their Tom Cruise bullshit, dropped their jingoistic bullshit, and were like, no, this is the one. I, I don't really intellectually understand why this is the one. I've seen so many brilliant big budget epics that I think in every in every sense are award worthy and worthy of being on top 10 lists and worthy of being talked about forever and ever and ever and ever that have so little to say about the state of affairs in the world and are just great films. What is it about this film? I mean that like I don't get I, I, I don't understand. I won't get into it too much but I will say my bigger thing and Tom and I've talked about this before that I think it's Maverick and the whole conversation around Maverick more em- is is emblematic of my frustration with present day film culture, which is all right. I want is consistency, and I I keep going back to uh, I reference it a lot. But do you remember that uh, the Ricky Gervais show he did with Warwick Davis, and they did that whole sketch with Liam Neeson? Do you remember this? Yeah, like life is short. Yeah, yeah. And they had a bit with Liam Neeson where Liam Neeson would do improv and he would keep making uh, jokes about AIDS and cancer and all that. And they would go, you can't joke about that. And he would point to Gervais and go, why is it okay when he does it? And they go, oh, we don't know. And I do feel like when it comes to the discussion around film and, and how we talk about film now, again, all I want from the film Twitter crowd and whatever is consistency in terms of like, what I can't stand is if I go, okay, you're saying it's good that this movie does A, whatever it is, right? You know, I, you, you're saying it's good that this movie uh, shoots on digital instead of film. This movie shot on digital instead of film. You know, or what, what, uh, no, but that's different. You're saying, and I, I'm not saying that movies can't do things to different degrees and different levels, right? And I would not have a problem if I could walk away, you know, I walked away from Maverick, for example, and I went, okay, yeah, that was, that was good. It was, it was one of the better legacy sequels that we've gotten. It's a legacy sequel, and it does some shit that's like very typical to the legacy sequel, but it's a fine Legacy sequel. I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a good time, and then I walk out, and all I wanted was to, to have a, a group of people agree and go, yeah, it does a couple things that are a little wonky. Some of that stuff is a, li-, uh, you know, I tweeted it out shortly after, but I was like, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's a good movie. It's a little closer to like the Ghostbusters afterlifes of the world than people want to admit. Like, there's some moments that are a little hokey. No, it's not. And you know, okay, so I know, but, but, but the point is like the fact that so many of the arguments in favor of this movie seem to be just in contrast with, well, it's not one of the superhero movies we get now, or, well, it's, you know, I like, there's so many things where, when I'm like, well, why is it okay when this movie does it, but this other movie does the same thing, and it's go, well, but that's different. It's, all I, I want I, is consistency, you know? I don't know uh, the answer to this, and, and I, I, I've noticed it over and over again, and I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, no I, way I, I know the answer. I know the answer. And it's not because it's a, not a superhero movie, it's the same reason why people are losing their minds over Avatar again. It's because for once in a landscape dominated by movies made by committee, we had a movie made in an old school real effects way by a filmmaker, by a real filmmaker who is trying to make a movie, not make content, not set up a spinoff, not set up a fucking Disney Plus show. This was an old school or tourist movie. Avatar, all CGI, right? Just like all the fucking Marvel movies, but you know what? James Cameron, one guy made it. That's it. That's why people, that's the difference. It's an old school, simple movie. Other war movies, you got to deal with messy politics. You got to deal with the real world. This movie, you don't even know what fucking country they're fighting. You don't even know if this is, in a, if this is set in a world where 9-11 happened. It's just, these guys are trying to set up a fucking like nuclear 
like mountain or whatever the fuck is at the end. We need to stop them from making nuclear mountain. Just do it. There's no politics. There's nothing. It's this thing they're trying to do is bad. Let's go stop them. We're going to plan to stop them. It's simple. But to simple Kenny's, like it was in but the to old days. Kenny's point that he was making before. Why is this movie the one that gets the pass in terms that's of like all I'm getting? I it. mean, like everything you said is everything you said. I agree. You with. said there, and I think that well, well, I think well, that's why it works. Well, 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 well yeah. for example, what what other movie doesn't get the pass? Okay, so here I'll give you. I mean, for an example, you mentioned there's no politics in this, right? There's no politics in yes. this. Okay. Um, so why, you know, people will find the politics in any other movie. How many years did we have to deal with fucking discourse about people going, well, when Superman hits all those buildings in Man of Steel and, and Batman versus Superman, yep. think of all the people that died. People will do this shit. What, what other movie? I'm because sorry. People, hang on. Hang on. Pe- I, got, I got months of fucking discourse about the fact that some of the characters in the historical story behind the women, the woman king were hundreds of years ago associated with human trafficking. We got think pieces on that. Meanwhile, we don't know where Shelley goddamn miscavige is, and Scientology did not even come up in the conversation around Tom Cruise because we were talking about what? it. And Why? you know what? All that bullshit about the women king came and went. Nobody fucking talked about it. People tried to make it a thing. It didn't happen. Okay, and the thing about the end of Man of Steel is the same thing that's happening with the Marvel movies now. People just constantly react to what is happening at the time. When Man of Steel came out, everybody said every comic book movie needs to be Marvel. So Zack Snyder made a movie that wasn't like Marvel. Well, we're going to attack it. Now everybody's sick of Marvel. We're going to give passes to things that aren't Marvel. And that's just not superheroes or special effects movies. That is any movie like Jurassic World or whatever the fuck, Fantastic Beast, any movie that feels like it's made by producers instead of filmmakers. Here's all I'm saying. Here's all I'm saying. I agree Top Gun is a movie. I agree it's excellent. Great time with the film. Saw it twice. I'm just trying to understand why this film has risen above the normal ceiling for a film like this when you talk about critical standards, both with you know your legacy critics as well as your film Twitter people. I'll give you an example of a film not that reason anymore, but exam- an example of film, another Tom Cruise film, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow is an excellent film. Excellent, excellent film that, that, that deconstructs the Tom Cruise persona at that moment in time as or more brilliantly than, than Top Gun it, Maverick is purported to do, which I think is the only, the only meta piece of this film that you can really dig your teeth into. This, this Tom Cruise is, right, is, is making a movie about himself. That's 100% true for Edge of Tomorrow as well. Edge of Tomorrow is a really great film. Now, I get it didn't make a lot of money, but neither did the fucking Fablemans. You don't need to make a lot of money anymore in order to have critics be like, this is an incredible film. So critics really did like that movie. Audiences really did like that movie. The, the, I picked a movie on purpose that had a good critical, that had a uh, high Rotten Tomato score and had people who were defending it on, on film Twitter. The point I'm making is that movie was never discussed for awards. That movie was never on people's top 10 lists. Why was it this film where P and that movie is, you know, a fairly jingoistic movie. And ultimately it's about, you know, Tom, in the sense it's about Tom Cruise's character finding his balls. Like, I mean, it really is. It really is in a lot of ways, you know, these things that, that Maverick is in terms of, you know, masculinity that we are uncomfortable with. And it's still a great film. And it still is made by, you know, uh, I think it's Doug Lyman film made by a, a one man with, in concert with Tom Cruise. It's what is it even I would even include the Mission Impossibles in this, which I hate all right, because what everyone else seems to love. All right. Edge of Tomorrow came out before the Macquarie entries of the Mission Impossible movies. That's when the Mission Impossible series became the unimpeachable standards of action on film Twitter. I get, I listen, I love the movies, but I do agree. People get a little nuts with the last two Mission Impossible movies. Fun times, great stunts. Okay, great. Before that, Cruz was still in a weird point in his career at the time. One, two, bad marketing. Three, kind of a shitty ending. That's why that movie didn't get. Another thing, why people are putting it up for awards, is because it fucking saved the, the, the movie theater industry. It like I'm sorry to say, it's the 12th highest grossing movie of all time. Because like we said, it brought everybody together. As it should, it was great. The, the initial reviews for that movie were so unbelievably over the top. Uh, I couldn't really believe it. Now, I, the other... I mean, because we don't see movies with like big budget, block, big budget blockbuster movies that 
are How? that simple and with scripts that are that simple okay. setup payoff Tom, it's it's an old action. blockbuster you're you're a massive action love action yeah yes this is an action film yeah uh it's a modern i guess you can call it a war movie but the, you know dog fighting is not the same as in in the trenches this is really an action film yes i can only think of one other action film ever nominated for best picture uh that doesn't have uh fantasy or science fiction elements that's what I really can't understand. Is this is the other one is the fugitive? Is this the only fucking other action movie ever that any that people have decided is worthy of this? I think. Look, with that being said, I do think one thing that is fascinating about the conversation around Top Gun Maverick and the Oscars that I think is undeniable when you just listen to the conversation up until the Oscar nominations came out, the contingent that was like Top Gun Maverick. Best picture, every nominated for fucking everything. That was very loud and very, very vocal. And there was a lot of groundswell for that. And then the nominations came out and it got nominated for best picture. And it got nominated for a bunch of technical awards, except the one award it undeniably deserves, which is bizarre, right? And then it gets a screenplay nomination. And it does feel like since then, since it got the nominations, it does feel like at least a part of that contingent went, all right, we got what we wanted out of that. I don't, I don't want to vote for it. You know what I mean? Like, the I don't know part, if I hear that. The other no. part is pushing really hard. They're putting out a full press. It, 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 it's a full court press on the, uh, on the, the second wave um, Oscar campaign. And it's currently third on, uh, on the, with the lines makers for, uh, for best picture. Top Gun Maverick might win, guys. I Listen. I am I am of the belief that Triangle of Sadness is so bad it's gonna win Best Picture. <laughs> loved it. I absolutely True. loved that movie. That terrible movie. movie. One of the terrible best movies movie. I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> terrible movie. Loved Kenny, everything. Kenny, Kenny, you want to talk? You dickhead white liberals. I was gonna say you want to talk about a movie preaching to the choir. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> I it, it has nothing to do with that for me. I have I have uh, in my life. In my life, never laughed as hard as I laughed for that second act. I was convulsing okay. throughout that second Now, act. I will sell out. I'm going to talk about it on our Oscar episode, so Kyle may cut it from this here. But I will admit that was I laughed at the vomit sequence. But, Kenny, I had a unique experience during the vomit sequence that made Tell it me. Hurt. So I went to a theater. This is a theater out on Long Island, the AMC. Convulsing. I was, uh, it's the AMC Westbury, so it's not a very popular theater. I was the only one in the theater for Triangle of Sadness when I saw it. Now, at around the time Woody Harrelson is going down to the dining room, a young couple sneaks into the theater to the back row to make out. Oh, that's I so know cool. they're there. They know I'm there, but they don't give a shit because it's just one guy in the theater. And Woody Harrelson goes down to do his toast at dinner and talk about socialism and whatever. The vomiting starts. And this young couple there to make out, I just kind of keep getting the sense out of my peripheral, because they're in the back corner, I'm in the middle of the theater. You can just kind of see as occasionally one or the other is clearly hearing the sound effects and being like, I'm sorry, what's happening? And like kind of looking at the screen, <laughs> trying to still make it work. And like, it was, it was truly, it was truly like when you see those movies about like the, you know, the guy's trying to, you know, uh, get it on with the girl and her dog just keeps staring at them. And he's just like, uh, do I, what do I do here? And eventually by the time the woman is grabbing onto the toilet and being flung back and forth by the boat, by the boat, they got up and left. Would and have been I'm, a hell I, of a time to find out that that's what the guy was into. <laughs> I, I mean, what social message did I take away from that movie? Virtually none. Um, but there was a sequence of old people vomiting for 45 minutes. And then there was the part where the other old guy started getting on the microphone and saying the ship was going down. And if you don't enjoy that, you just don't like cinema. I don't know what to tell you guys. <laughs> the only thing that got a mild chuckle out of me is when the war criminal old couple picks up a, one of their that own was, grenades that was and good. then just explodes. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> right. was so mild right. chuckle. Now, now I have to, I have to get this. Pl no, we have to, we have uh, to get wait, back. No, 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 no. Wait, I'm, I'm, br I'm, I'm bringing it back. I'm going to bring it back. All right. I, I thought of another movie very soon. What, do, Kenny? What are your feelings on Cool Hand Luke? Uh, I like Cool Hand Luke a lot. I don't love Feels Cool very, Hand Luke. It's but it's almost playing in a similar 
playground to this movie. Almost, not exactly. Yeah, no, I, 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 you, I thought about Cool Hand Luke because the the old prisons. You know, there's something to because I remember watching Cool Hand Luke probably 20 years ago. I remember exactly when I watched it, and I hadn't watched a lot of prison movies. And it's one of those prisons where you know you're pretty much just you're 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 just you know kept in by you're in a you're in a pen with with wood with some spikes yeah. on the top. And that's the same for the you know the chain gang, except that, you know in that movie they're literally chained to their fucking beds. It's unbelievable. And also the same for Life, which is a '99 movie that kind of you know plays in the same playground or a sandbox a little bit. You know if you can call it prison a sandbox, that's an underrated movie. Uh, pretty good. Very movie. underrated movie. But no, uh, my fucking cool, Brian. Cool. I I like Cool Hand Luke a lot. I like uh, One Flew the, Over the Cuckoo's Nest a lot more, and I think they're doing very similar things. Well, I um, just in just in the uh, as, as you asked, prison movies that had uh, unhappy endings can't get much unhappier than watching Paul Newman get shot to death because he just kept making the prison warden look like an idiot. Yeah. Now, real quick, I want to highlight a couple things before we, uh, you know, wind. Part of the beauty of this film, when we talked about not being didactic, not being preachy, is this is a great example of show don't tell in a lot of ways. You know, it doesn't hammer things too hard. Uh, that incredible moment when Paul Muni goes to the pawn shop to try and hawk his medal and the shop owner just points to the box oh, of medals already there. Like, yeah, that's so right. good. Even the moments like, you know, when he goes to the construction foreman, can you use me? Well, last week I could have used you. I'm all full up now. Basically, without going out of its way to tell you, like, yeah, if he hadn't listened to his priest brother and taken the factory job, he could have gotten this construction job, uh, which he wanted, and it all would have been, you know, it all would have been fine. And we didn't even talk about the fact that it is such a, at so many points, it is such a master class of tension. That sequence when he's in the barber shop. And the guy comes oh, so in, good. and you have that exchange of, was that close enough? Plenty. Just so good. Well, you know, that's one of the brilliant things. Another brilliant thing about the movie is that it's a prison movie, but also kind of not a prison movie yeah. for the vast Half majority of, out of the of, prison. Yeah. I mean, because you get, what, like 10, 15, 20 minutes before he goes to the prison for the first time. And then it's not too long before he breaks out. A lot of it is setting up his life before prison and then setting up his life post breakout and a lot of it is that which is you know it's it's just a brilliant way of like all right we've been there we know what is at stake so spend the rest of the movie like him knowing what is waiting for him if the other shoe drops and you're just like fuck fuck okay i hope i hope nothing happens because i know what's gonna happen if he goes back oh no oh no there is a bit of a uh again i use this term cognitive dissonance for me when I see a movie from this period that's as uh, artistically rewarding as this film. Because it's hard for me to believe that these directors like Mervyn Leroy, who are making like six films a year, are capable of, of imbuing these films with the artistic vision that they are. So for instance, all you, everything you guys are saying, something that struck me is the first scene of this film is like them coming back from war. Mm -hmm. And it could have been the first scene of a, of a, of a of a, a comedic review about guys coming back from the war they, it's 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 out of mayberry these guys are so happy they're so clean they're so excited about their lives the it's jokey um there's no indication at all of the movie you're about to see and that to me is almost a commentary on so many so many propagandist films about happy soldiers coming back from war and returning you know a, a very kind of musical idea uh, of re and returning back to their, their the towns they left before before he gets into this unbelievably dire circumstance pretty quickly and it becomes this deeply naturalistic film that's so unexpected from a film with it, from a studio film at this time not that they weren't all but you know just the this idea of these guys I the the the, the guts and the and the and the balls and the, the 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 location use in this film yeah. You know, actually filming outside on location in these quarries, these wide shots of 50 prisoners sleeping on the rocks or banging or, you know, clearing these rocks. It's, you know what I think the, the one thing about this film that has held it back over the last 90 years? When you told me I was doing this film, and I think you told me and Phil together, mm -hmm. we both kind of chuckled because the title's kind of silly. And... I think that uh, 
I, I think that that is a little bit of a barrier for a modern audience. Now, I will say well, this. I, was, I, was... I, I will... S- just a little bit of context here. It wasn't silly at the time. And by that, I mean, you have no, to... No, no, I, I know. I, that's why I specified the last yeah, 90 years. But I, I mean, like, it, what hurts it in a way, you know, is that when you hear, I am a fugitive from a chain gang, at least to me, like, my brain jumps to a million Roger Corman movies that were, you know, like, I was a teenage yeah. werewolf. I was a this and that. Yeah. Even, like, I was well, a male yeah. war bride. But the thing that sets this apart, in a way, is that I think the tense is so important. If this movie were called I Was a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, it's far less effective, whereas just the use of M, to me, like, I am a fugitive from a chain gang, it's like a call me Ishmael of a movie. Like you just immediately are hit by it. I I don't think that's the point Kenny's making. I think the point he's making is that it's it's a mouthful. Whether it's M or was, it's a it's a long title. It feels like an Italian fucking horror movie. Your vice is a locked door and I I'm the only one with a key. It's like, "All right, can you get to the point a little bit quicker with your title there, buddy?" You know. That and 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 I I do think that that modern audiences have never really been confronted with uh the notion of a chain gang and i think it you know the million fucking mickey cartoons uh i I think it kind of seems a little silly at this point um so silly like so like so ancient you know the idea that 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 we would do that that and i do think it's been played for laughs so many times by the mel brooks's of the world that um that it's 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 lost its bite and it's become kind of silly and I, you know, if it was just called, I don't know, Fugitive, I, I think maybe, I don't know. I, it's such a weird, I don't understand why this movie isn't, isn't considered one of the you know, 10 all-time classics of all. I, I, I don't understand why this is not like AFI Top 10. I don't understand why this is not you know, Sight and Sound fucking 100. I don't get it. I, I don't get what's, what the issue is. I think part of the reason is that while this movie is sad, and sad movies are part of the the AFI 100 in the canon, the sad movies that get to be in that canon are kind of melodramatic for the most part. And that's not a criticism, right? That's not me saying that they're bad per se, but there's a heightenedness to them. There's a, uh, you know, Rick and Ilsa saying goodbye on the plane tarmac. Right? Say, there's something, you know, Blanca, right? yeah, yeah. There's, which is, <laughs> which touches a real emotion, but the circumstances are dramatic enough to remove you from them, right? I talked to, it's so interesting, um, so my, my partner, who's, she's been on the show before, she's Russian, and we watch a lot of Russian films together that her family likes, and my understanding of Russian cinema and her understanding of Russian cinema are so totally different, have watched, you know, before we, went to, before we got together, I watched the Andrei Tarkovsky films, right, and Battleship Potemkin, and the cranes are flying. The Russian films that made it to America, which are the ones that are very sad and very bleak and very humanist. Meanwhile, you talk to Russians, like you talk to her family, and I'm like, hey, you guys want to watch Battleship Potemkin? And they go, no, that's sad. What we watch is. To watch Battleship Potemkin? They were doing a rep screening down at the anthology <laughs> film archives. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, I, but they watch, you know, uh, Suja, they watch like, you know. Can you imagine a bunch of Russians ask if you want to go watch Birth of a Nation? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> um, but uh, Hello, Michael, would you like to see Birth of a Nation? <laughs> but uh, Great American film, Birth of a Nation. <laughs> Great American film, thumbs up, yes? Two thumbs up. <laughs> Do you think her family is Borat, Tom? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean... Anyway. Anyway, <laughs> but like they don't watch. I'm dying. You have to see my... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mike. <laughs> now, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. To be fair, to be fair, they, you know, they're died in the wool Stalinists. That movie's a good thing. Yeah. At that point. Like that movie's about the revolution. Like that's like, yeah, good. We won. Oh, you know? the nation, when the nation was the first one that came yeah. off my head, but it's yeah. just so silly. <laughs> so, but in any event, you know, like they don't watch those films. They watch the comedies, right? You know, every year on New Year's Eve, they air this uh, this movie about a guy who gets drunk at a bathhouse and stumbles into the wrong apartment, and it's three hours long. Like, they watch those movies. They don't want to watch the same ones. I think that with Fugitive from a Chain Gang and its reputation in the canon, nobody's running it on television because 
people wouldn't want to watch that on television the way that they would watch a Casablanca or even a Citizen Happy Kane. Or one night. Like and yeah. Really, yeah. Well, I think Citizen Kane's an interesting comp. Just, I mean, I know, I know, you know, the, uh, I, I've watched Citizen Kane so many times and I've watched it so many times on like TCM. And it's not an enjoy. I mean, it's an enjoyable film, I guess, but it's, it's so bleak. Every, every moment is darker than the last in that film. And, uh, that hasn't precluded it from being, you know, but it's but it's darkness and... again is operatic, and its darkness is what profit a man like the the takeaway is what profit a man, man if he yeah. if he gain the world but lose his soul? It's a morality lesson, right? There's a morality tale to it. So many of the classic movies and classic stories are morality tales. There is nothing about I am a fugitive from a chain gang that is a morality tale. It is a movie that is basically just going, the system is broken. Be cool if we could reform it, but just know you're screwed at any moment. You know, I, I think that it was effective in its, in its time and it was very powerful in its time. But it's also like, I don't know if there was anybody revisiting that because I don't know if there was ever a point where somebody's like, you know what? You should check out for a good time. Like, it kids, go down time. to the local block, but it is. It's a well, great film, but it's just, it's not, you know, it's so an emergency. I, I, yeah. I want to ask you guys more about your podcast. This was a find for you guys. What did you expect going into it? This film? Uh, I didn't yeah. expect shit going into it. I didn't know what to expect. Sometimes with these, a lot of the times with there's so many movies that I've never heard of or I've just heard of and never seen. And when we get to those movies, I say, all right, I'm going in blind. I don't want to know what we're going to get. So I, I try to figure it out as the movie's going. And like I said before, I thought this was going to be a movie where he escapes and it's all good at the end. He exposes the chain gang system and he's lauded as a hero and he gets free at the yeah, end. I you know, I did not expect it. I did not expect it to be this deeply cynical, almost nihilistic movie about how essentially America fucking sucks. And at no point are you safe from its wrath that it almost feels like a documentary at points, which is not to say it's not a very artistic movie. But it, it it has a grittiness to it, which is a point I was, uh, when you were talking about cognitive dissonance, something that blows my mind is that this is five years after The Jazz Singer. Sound cinema is still, like, brand fucking new. Yeah. And five years in, we've got, you know, shit like this already. That's, that to me, that's the dissonance. I mean, you know, and yeah, we're pre-code, but yeah, I had I had no idea what... To, what I was gonna get watching. I I watched. Yeah, I mean, not to. I, I want to. Yeah, you have to get the mic, but uh, I watched a face in a face in the crowd two weeks ago, something like that. Yeah, uh, a movie that was made twenty five years after, and a good movie, a very good movie, a movie I really liked. And in every way, is this movie more technically uh, impressive? It's more <laughs> narratively daring, and that's a movie that's considered to be quite narratively daring. A face in the crowd. You know, and quite thematically daring. And it, and it was, I guess. But what they did, as you said, five years after the advent of sound, and, and kind of, I'm sure, coming up with a lot of these technologies on the fly, right? Or so remarkable. I mean, I, when you asked, like, how did I see this? I saw it a couple of years ago in prep for a different podcast episode uh, because I do this little extra legwork here. I'd been aware of it for a while um, because it is, if you read, like, books on film history you know it does come up a lot one of the fascinating things about you know studying film and it's true of any artistic medium right which is the canon can expand like the national film registry has new movies every year but our popular consciousness of the canon is always going to knock things out to make room for new things and that's why when you look at these greatest film lists you mentioned the afi list kenny you know you look at AFI lists that are now, all of them, at least a decade old. You look at AFI lists, and there are movies they cite that when those AFI lists came out, people went, well, of course. But now you go, I'm, I'm sorry? Like, you know, movies that don't stand the test of time terribly well, that at the time they did, and they got raves. Love Story. By, wow. No, but really, like, Love Story was such a huge hit. It was such a phenomenon. Huge hit. Love means yeah, everyone so say, sorry. It was nominated for Best Picture. It was on all these lists. And when the baby boomers fade from this uh, mortal coil, n few people will watch Love Story ever again. Uh, it's fallen out of the canon, despite having a place there once, right? 
you know, there's certain movies that we hype ourselves up about in the moment that we lose. And there's other movies that are great movies. They really are that just lose their place. And, and a perfect example is another Paul Muni movie, which is Scarface, The Shame of a Nation, which for a generation of filmmakers is just part of that canon. It's up there with your White Heat, your Little Caesar, what have you. And then like Scarface sort of fell off before White Heat and Little Caesar did. and now. You know, the current generation of, of film people probably don't even watch White Heat or Little Caesar. So I've known about it. But they're there. They're, they're, they're there. But they're there. They're there. I'm not. Yeah, I, no, I do. I, yeah. No, no, no. I know what you're saying. I think, you know, and they might be the next casualties. But uh, yeah, what, White Heat still is in, the, in, in, in this larger consciousness, right? Uh, and I think you're right. I, I hear what you're saying that that every generation we do lose some. If 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 I had to make a guess, honestly, I think it's because the movie was too effective. The fact that chain gangs kind of really don't exist anymore. It's a movie where it's punch. Yeah. At least for like modern people that don't know what a chain gang is or was, they would watch it and be like, "Wait, what is this? Is this, like this used to happen? I don't like this isn't a problem anymore. It's the ordinary yeah, people I, I problem." Yeah, I mean, I'm not you know, saying that they're equal quality, no, but like I know. those movies. No, I know. I, yeah. yeah, ordinary people. Well, what's the or, what's the ordinary people? Bro? So when you talk to somebody my parents' age about uh, certain movies, specifically, specifically ordinary people, uh, Kramer versus Kramer is another one. Uh, China Syndrome is another one. Uh, to a lesser extent, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is another one. Which is kind of these seventies, but late sixties, seventies issue message me, movies, issue movies, issue where movie, issue movies, where the issue, and I'm not saying everything's fine, but where the issue is resolved, insofar as the movie was so effective, right? The China oh. Syndrome was so fucking effective that now we're dealing with the opposite problem where there are people going, guys, we don't need to be this paranoid about nuclear, but we are. We did Raging Bull on season two, and now it is really easy to sit back and go, Raging Bull should have won Best Picture, right? We all know it. We all feel it. But when you talk to people, when ordinary people came out when you talk to people about that film they i mean you know my parents and all will sort of like but you don't understand number one how little the idea of therapy was being talked about in that way and normalized in that way number two what it was like to see a waspy family deal with that because we were talking about therapy as a thing that just affects you know poor people or crazy people or something. like it was they talk about how effective it was and in fact it was so effective in normalizing the idea of therapy and normalizing the idea of seeking help, that it is impossible for people our age to see that movie as radical because it was so effective. There are movies that were so successful in achieving what their modest goal was at the yeah, time. Yeah. And we mentioned, you know, we mentioned something like, and again, this is a much more problematic text, and I know that, but we mentioned something like Uncle Tom's Cabin. Society has obviously moved on from Uncle Tom's Cabin. There's nobody rushing to go to the Harriet Beecher Stowe house now, right? And there are certainly many, many problematic elements of that, that text and all that. But it is impossible for somebody, you know, in our generation to, to uh, necessarily understand how urgent and earth-shattering that book felt. Because we kind of maybe look at it and go like, we should have all known this already, you know? But there's certain works and certain pieces of art that lose their effectiveness. Now, I think because we're still dealing with so many issues in the justice system, Fugitive from a Chain Gang is still radically affecting. I think we all agree with that. But to Tom's point about chain gangs not really being, you know, an issue we, we have to tackle societally now, like, that does take a bit of the urgency away in, in a way that, you know, and look, it, it comes in waves, right? Things can change and things can come back into the public consciousness. There are a lot of movies about labor activism that nobody like the last like three or four years the national film industry has inducted at least one or two movies about labor activism because they're like well this is an important issue now nobody was talking about those movies back when like reagan shut down palco right like that was not we were like well we're past this now like we're this has gotten too much so i think it, it can ebb and flow cool but in its <laughs> day in its day it was a celebrated film. And to that point, Tom, as we often wrap up doing, as we have now talked longer than the movie itself, uh, Tom, how do you think I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang fared at the Academy Awards? Um, 
Do you not know the answer? He doesn't look these up beforehand. That's the whole game here. Right, right, right. Okay. So, Tom? Uh, I don't know. Best picture, best screenplay, nominated, didn't win anything. Okay. So, I can tell you you were correct about picture. It was nominated for best picture alongside 42nd Street, A Farewell to Arms, Lady for a Day, Little Women, The Private Life of Henry VIII, She Done Him Wrong, Smiling Through, State Fair, and the winner, Cavalcade. Uh, It was also nominated for Best Actor for Paul Muni, who lost to Charles Lawton for The Private Life of Henry VIII, and nominated for Best Sound Recording, which it lost to A Farewell to Arms. Now, just to point out, uh, of those picture nominees, 42nd Street, She Done Him Wrong, and State Fair are all in the National Film Registry. Cavalcade is not, in part because it's boring. (laughs) <laughs> I try not to speak ill, but my God, they made the wrong choice this have you, year. Have you seen every? Uh, you've seen every Best Picture, right? I've seen every Best Picture right. winner, and I always watch the nominees for whatever films we're talking about. So I've watched this whole year. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. No, Cavalcade's very boring. Yeah, it's boring as shit. Um, yeah, it's it's very it's, long, right? It. I don't remember how long it is. I just remember that it doesn't have a purpose. It's right. listless, and and the weird thing is like. You can understand it if it was a weaker year, but like 42nd Street is here. Little Women. She done him wrong. Like there are, and, and obviously the best one of them all is I'm a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, but like this is a real good year and that movie is just not real. It's just, it's barely there. It's almost weirder that they occasionally got it right in the, in the first decade. It's, it's, look, I will say that one of the fascinating things when you watch the Best Picture winners is it is fascinating to see how often they reflect their era, you know, and, and what people were talking about at the time, what they were feeling at the time. It doesn't always age the best, but that's kind of the game of this. And part of what we love about the registry, honestly, is they wait 10 years. It has to be at least 10 years old to be inducted so that all of the hype can die down around things. Like, you know, I know we got into a bit of a maverick tangent. We can, you know, Right now, when we do our Oscar episode in a couple weeks, I'm sure it's going to be up for debate. Like, well, we'll, in 10 years, will this be in the National Film Registry? We can never really know because Towering Inferno was up for Best Picture in its year. That was a huge deal in its year. And there's nobody now who watches Towering Inferno and goes, well, of course, I get it. And yet, Mm -hmm. conversely, I'm certain because of how much money it made and what a populist hit it was, that there were people when The Godfather won Best Picture over Cabaret and Deliverance and all that who went, this is not going to stand the test of time. And it sure as shit has. So, you know, who's who's to say? Um, I mean, obviously, I think we can all recognize the Cavalcade win is is dumb, but, you know, the registry, uh, as we went out in its third year, uh, made a point to put in I'm a Fugitive from a Chain Gang before so many of the other movies that people would push for as canonical classics, so I think that speaks to its lasting power and its mm-hmm. social relevance. So Calvacade, left in a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so I think the Titanic happens at one point. I don't remember. I really don't. It's such a blur. I even remember worse movies than I remember that one. Like I could tell you more about fucking Cimarron than I could tell you about Cavalcade. I don't Tim Ron's the other one from that period of time that is just forever and ever. I mean, I, th- I think they're both like three-hour movies. No, what? Cimarron? I, th- I thought I don't. Maybe Cimarron's Cimarron's at least like it's a western. That's kind of interesting, but because it's and it's weird because that's like what is it? I think it's Wings is the first one, then Broadway Melody, which is bad, but whatever. Which is um, weird. And then no, oh, no, it's short. You're right. A cowboy kid's short. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's I think it's what Wings is the first. That's you know blockbuster. That's really exciting. Um, which by the way, I just want to be clear, and I'll I'll we'll wrap this up. You remember how in past Oscar years, they would show clips of old Oscar winners or Oscar movies to lead into the clips of the new nominees. Sometimes, yeah. I swear to fucking God, if they don't do that this year and they don't edit together a scene from Wings into a scene from Top Gun Maverick, this is all pointless. <laughs> all of this is pointless. If you aren't going to draw the out. line from the first Best Picture winner to this, if you're not going to do that, don't do the Oscars. Just don't do it. This is a waste of everyone's time at that point. I agree with you. But, uh, yeah, I think that... 
I want to leave everyone with this one Oscar thought. People seem to think that the voting body is sentimental and that they give people awards just for um, sentimental reasons. Chadwick Boseman losing the award when he's dead to Anthony Hopkins, who already has one, who's 100 years old, <laughs> is, is exhibit A that do not predict Oscars based on what you think the Academy's heartstrings are being pulled. Glenn Close lost, Lauren Bacall lost, Sylvester Stallone lost. This happens all the time, which is to say, watch out, Angela Bassett. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for uh, coming thank on our you, show. And not only coming on our show, but doing exactly what we knew Kenny Nybart would do if we had him on for I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, me. Which, is, which is take the episode in a bunch of different tangents and directions and have us talk longer than the movie, which is, might be the first time we've done that besides like meshes of the afternoon in the river. Like the first time wow, we've done that. Wow, really? Well, we've, most times we don't exceed the runtime of a movie. The only times we've done it are when the movies are 10 minutes long. You know, but in I, this yeah, case, I, you know, I, uh, ninety minute movie. We, I can't stop talking. You know how it is. Well, I, I haven't podcasted in a month, and I have so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> but Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. Now you don't podcast anymore, and you've also quit social media. So, do you have anything that you want to plug uh, on the way out? Sure, I, I write on Step Up. Uh, uh, it's on Stars, and it got canceled. So you can go watch it if you want. But <laughs> my favorite part of that, Kenny, is you almost saying the former title too. So I almost said "Step of High Water." You're right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, I'm amazed you picked up on that. Yes, I almost said "Step of High Water." It's called "Step Up." Uh, it's on Stars and uh, it's canceled. So uh, I'm writing other things that are not on uh, television yet. But um, yeah, guys, I love you. You're, you're the best. Doing podcasts uh, like it's 1999 was only good because I met you. <laughs> So. <laughs> oh thank well, you buddy Kenny thank you so much we will uh, I, you know what I'm sorry we gotta keep dragging you back it's been a, a seasonal tradition to have both you and Phil on we're gonna keep every doing that year. every season so uh, I'm gonna look at the registry right now oh don't start pre-calling things we have too many people doing that and it puts no 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 I, I, I told you I'm not doing anything I mean, you, you pick for now All right. on well, but, that's, um, you know what? I just wanna look I mean, I love that precedent that we just pick for you, Kenny, but please know at least once we're going to pick something so far outside your wheelhouse just for kids. I don't care. Like, you I might don't care. You, you can... might be the guy that gets color bars, you know? That's <laughs> coming. Color... In a future season, we got to do... Yes, I remember when color bars made that's, the list. That's, we're very, very excited. That's the promise that I've made to people is every episode gets at least 40 minutes, which means when color bar test pattern is an episode, Tom and I got to fill 40 plus minutes on a five second clip of colors on a screen so it's gonna be i know, I'm a gonna, hoot. I, I know it's gonna be me all right <laughs> uh but kenny <laughs> thank you so much for joining us everybody else stick around we'll be right back with our picks for the national film registry the national film registry isn't some fixed object frozen in time it's always growing adding new titles every year these annual selections are made by the national film preservation board with members and representatives from organizations like the Academy, the DGA, and the AFI coming together to debate and decide. But they don't just pull titles out of thin air. They pull from the public, people like you and me, who can submit their nominations for the registry in the form on the Library of Congress's website. What we do, at the end of every episode, is have Mike and Tom pick films not yet in the registry that they feel should be, inspired by that day's topic. At the end of each season, those films will be formally submitted to the National Film Registry for consideration on behalf of your missing out. The only criteria? It must be an American film that's at least 10 years old. Here are today's picks. I did honestly have some difficulty with this one, but I, I took a walk amongst my massive collection of movies trying to get some ideas going. And then one just hit me right in the face kind of a perfect companion piece to this movie. One of the great prison movies of all time. It's one of the early, it's, I don't know if it's the earliest, whatever, I don't, but it's one of the landmark prison movies. Uh, it's the first film by a low-key landmark director, one of those guys we don't talk about in terms of being one of the greats of his era, but a guy whose reach is wildly, like, everlasting. The tendrils of his work which started here is continues to influence filmmakers to this day. Um, 
one of whom is uh, still working. Prison movie, really gritty, feels very documentary-like, but it's not doing what this movie does, which it's not based on a true story per se, even though it's kind of like, yeah, these things have happened, so we're kind of mixing and matching, blah, blah, blah. Not the first jail movie this man has made, maybe not even the best prison movie this man has made, but I think it deserves entry for the movie itself, for its place as this man's debut. I'm put, picking Riot and Cell Block 11, Don Siegel's first movie. It is a masterful work of 1950s cinema. It, if being in the 1950s and having to deal with Hayes Code, it doesn't lose lack any grit or hard-hitting violence. It is a dirty, nasty movie that really, in its way, gets to similar points that this movie does, which is how the system does, is not meant to rehabilitate. It is meant to punish, and it turns these men into lesser than men. They are not men at this point. They are just they're animals raging against their keepers, basically, and they just want basic decency, and they're not getting it. It's a fantastic movie. It's in the Criterion Collection. It still feels like it's not uh, talked about as much as it should. One, because Siegel doesn't get the, the recognition I think he deserves, mainly because Clint, his main protege, kind of overshadowed him in doing a lot of similar things. Um, and also because Escape from Alcatraz is uh, arguably the better movie. I don't know where I fall. Depends on the day. But either way, this is a masterpiece that Honestly, you you could put this in a double feature at a movie theater and you would have a quite the upsetting penitentiary themed double feature for yourself. So right in cell block 11, that is my choice. So I was thinking about, you know, one of the things that's so impressive about I am a fugitive from a chain gang to me is not just the fact that it's based on a true story, but there are so many prison movies in in the pantheon of cinema we've got a ton of of prison movies uh it's a whole subgenre one of the things that i'm fugitive of chain gang does that i think is so interesting is the way that it examines uh paul muni's character's life after prison and that sort of constant specter over him and the way that the justice air quotes justice system is never done with you it always lingers, and you can never truly escape it. And I think that that is also true of a movie that just became eligible for the registry uh, this year, because we are in 2023, and this was a 2013 film uh, that is also one of the best films of the 2010s, uh, a landmark feature debut from one of the most interesting directors of the 2010s, and one of the most interesting stars of the 2010s going into the 2020s. Uh, and a movie that, like the first time I saw I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, I remember sitting and seeing this in the theaters and just being absolutely knocked out by it. And I, that is Fruitvale Station by Ryan Coogler. It's just an extraordinarily powerful film about the last day in the life of Oscar Grant III, another uh, real person whose story is depicted on film. It's absolutely harrowing. Uh, in some senses, to understand, much like I'm a Fugitive from a Chain Gang did in so many of those kind of prisoner ex-con films of that era of the 30s did, really trying to convey to the audience just, you know, this is a person. These are people. We're all just people and how dehumanizing our, our system is. So um, I think it's, Fruitvale Station is one of the landmark works of the 2010. It's um, of the 2010s, you know, Kugler's an incredible director, Jordan Star, they're all stars. It's just a, a masterful work that I think uh, absolutely deserves a place in the national film industry. Let's all go to the lobby, lobby, lobby. Thank you again, Kenny Nybart, for joining us. Next week, another returning guest from season one. Carrie McCabe is back for 1951's A Place in the Sun. Don't forget to follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time. on your missing out. They honor movies of historical, cultural, or aesthetic importance on the National Film Registry. <laughs>